A little girl with blonde hair is sitting in front of the emperor, who is sitting on his throne, surrounded by his subjects. The people around her are whispering indignantly that this girl is useless. She has no magic, and she is a disgrace to the empire. The empire's chief wizard conjures something over the magic ball, which emits a faint glow. One of his highness's bodyguards standing next to him says something to him that is inaudible to the others. A white-haired girl desperately calls out to her father, begging him for something. But his highness always seemed indifferent to his child. Suddenly, the girl wakes up in her room in a cold sweat. She stands up abruptly and breathes a sigh of relief. She was very frightened, and it turned out to be just a nightmare. Her bedroom is very luxurious and shines with rich beauty and cleanliness. But the girl cannot remember the place at all. Do modern hospitals have such elegant interiors? She looks at her light and delicate hands and remembers that they were completely different in the past. She looks at the mirror beside her bed. The girl clumsily climbs down from the bed, which is not too high for her. She starts walking quickly towards the mirror. She sees a completely different reflection from the one she saw yesterday or the day before. But her appearance is charming. She begins to stretch, as if doing a movement, and continues to look at herself in the mirror. She puffs up her cheeks and grimaces, unable to stop admiring her new gorgeous body. But this state turns into a hysteria that can be heard throughout the manor. A woman who looks like a maid from an earlier time comes running into the girl's room. She asks what is wrong and what has happened, calling the girl her highness. By this time, the child was already sitting on the floor, frightened by what she saw in the mirror. The maid is also frightened by this behavior. With big eyes like saucers, she asks what is wrong and if the girl is hurt. The princess panics and grabs the maid by the shoulders and asks where she is. The maid tries to calm the girl down and says that, of course, she's in her room in the palace. She asks why the princess is asking such strange questions and if it could be because she almost drowned in the lake. She touches her forehead and finds that she has no fever. The girl calms down a bit and wonders why she's in a room in the palace and why she is called Her Highness. The maid takes her into her arms. She asks Her Highness why she shouldn't take care of herself a little more. The maid sits her down on the bed and tells her that she is a princess, whether she has magic powers or not. She asks why the girl decided to commit suicide by jumping into the lake and whether it was only because of unfounded gossip and senseless slander. The girl continues to think about what the girl is saying. She calls her a princess and says something about magic. It all sounds like a lot of bullshit to her. She takes a deep breath. She says that she has lost her memory. The maid continues to speak. But she suddenly realizes that her highness has lost her memory. The girl sits down on a chair and begins to pretend to remember something, as the memory of the previous princess is present in her. She says that her name is Abel, that she is a princess of the Rayfenstry Empire, and that she is her personal maid Jilmer, and asks if she remembers everything correctly. Jilmer nods her head, confirming that she does. Rifenstre, Abel. All this sounds so familiar because this is the world of the book, the beloved of the Knight of the Empire, and her Siao, a young girl of the 21st century. She ended up here. The door to Abel's room will open. The emperor and the mage enter. Jilmer bows to his highness. The princess begins to realize who this man in imperial robes is for her. It is her own father. The youngest emperor on the throne of Rafenstre, Altfer. From the moment he ascended the throne at the age of 19, he waged war against all the lands surrounding the realm. Within 10 years, his territory doubled. The empire was never more prosperous than under Altfer, but he, the personification of the god of war, was not. Remarkably refined features. The emperor asks the maid what happened. The girl apologizes to his highness and says that she was neglecting her duties. The emperor asks what the princess's bodyguard was doing and why he was not protecting her properly. Jomer tries to speak, but her lips are trembling with fear. She looks at Abel and tries to say something about Sir Leron, her bodyguard. The emperor comes very close to the maid and she begins to look at him in fear. He orders her to answer. Jomer is completely frightened. She quickly replies that Sir Leron offended her highness some time ago, and perhaps he has recovered since then. She's very sorry that she had to betray her highness, the princess. It's just that his highness, the emperor, really scared her. Abel thinks that the owner of this body has a terrible temper. Anyone who makes her angry will surely be punished. There is something like that in her memories. Altfer turns his head to the side and his eyes look at his daughter. This look is very scary. Abel thinks she'll get it because of the real owner of this body. The emperor asks how a miserable political hostage dared to upset the princess and orders him to be brought here. The princess thinks that the emperor should not be so prejudiced. He makes a gesture that only his wizard understands. The old man approaches the girl, and Alver turns his gaze back to the girl and she freezes again in fear. Abel takes a step back. The wizard's staff begins to glow brightly. He asks her highness to stay where she is and begins to work his magic on her. The girl's feet are lifted off the ground and she is lifted into the air. She sees magic for the first time. The magic gradually fades. Iabel carefully sinks back to the ground. The wizard bows and says that the princess is no longer ill, but that due to a cold she caught at the lake, her highness must rest for the next few days. 
Altfer turns his attention back to the girl and she once again freezes in fear. She thinks he still wants to punish her when his highness puts his hand on her head, but he only caresses his daughter. He says that he is glad that she is well now. Abel thinks he changed his mood too quickly. The princess's bodyguard enters the room, dragging her beaten bodyguard with him and tells his highness that he has obeyed his orders. He tells Sir Laurent to kneel before his highness immediately and throws him to the ground. The boy looks at the princess with devotion. She takes another step back, hiding behind the emperor's robe. Altver says that as a bodyguard, he could not protect the princess and asks what punishment he thinks he deserves. The boy turns his head away without answering. The emperor says that he doesn't seem to want to stay here. Suddenly, the princess tells her father that she was not careful enough and that it was not his fault. Laurent is very surprised that her highness is standing up for him. Abel decided to write down everything she could remember. Beloved of the Knight of the Empire, Lemuria, Rafenstre Empire, Altver. Nowadays, when stories about traveling through time and space become popular, others easily move and find themselves in the role of the main characters. Abel is the second princess of the empire who was reborn at the age of six, the same day she was said to have no magical powers. By nature, she is very impulsive. She created obstacles for the main character out of nothing and was sentenced to death for it. She does not like the fact that she became a secondary villain during the transfer and also a character who has to survive the death penalty. Abel wonders why she has to suffer so much and her eyes reflect an emptiness. She does not want to accept this fate. She wants to get to the bottom of it as soon as possible. She finds herself on the continent of Atarui, in the world of the book Beloved of the Night of the Empire, a world where magic exists. Rafenstray is the most developed country on this continent. And now she is here as the emperor's only daughter, Princess Abel, until Limeria appears in the story of this book. The second princess without magical powers and the first to have been exiled abroad since childhood. Gentle and kind to her family, a worthy ruler. The other is bold and capricious, a true thief. The end of such a story is always the same. The heroine lives happily ever after with her prince. And the cruel villain is executed, abandoned and rejected by everyone. Abel seems a mockery. Whoever thought of these rules of history? She refuses to accept them. No matter how she does it, she must avoid such a tragic fate. The girl shows Laurent and Jilmer with all her movements that she has a problem. The maid is really worried about her highness and thinks it's all because she jumped into the lake and lost her memory. Abel continues to take notes with great enthusiasm. Laurent wonders what could have happened to her and why she stood up for him. Is this just another way to bully him? At one point, their eyes cross. A smile appears on the princess's face. This, of course, shocks her bodyguard, but he just looks away. Abel thinks he's being very brave. Laurent is the prince of the state of Salently. Because he has black hair and eyes, he has always been bullied. At the age of 10, he was given as a pledge to the Rafenstray Empire. As a bodyguard, he had to endure many humiliations. At the age of 12, because he had upset Abel, he was returned to his homeland so that it would not happen again. A political prisoner in exile. We can guess what happened next. After all, he plays a minor role and is mentioned in only a few sentences. Therefore, like other minor characters, he is relegated to the background. But his gaze. The princess finds him very attractive. But then she immediately thinks that now is not the time to admire beauty. Abel finishes his writing, and the first step in her plan of salvation is to adapt herself to the world in which she finds herself. The girl asks Laurent in a sweet and friendly way if his wounds are healed and if he is no longer in pain. But the boy already imagines her as a bad girl with a whip. He gets down on one knee and tells her that everything is fine and that her highness need not worry. But Abel says she didn't mean it and asks why he looks like he's about to die. Now the girl thinks that the character of the original owner of the body is even worse than she thought. She tells Laron to get up. She promises not to hurt him again. The princess swears on her honorable name. She extends her hand to the boy. Ignoring the gesture, the boy stands up on his own. The princess suggests that they call a truce. Someone enters the room and asks if Laron shouldn't be more polite to the princess. Mr. Neil enters the room. Jilmer bows to the boy. The princess remembers that he was the only one who protected Abel from the beginning to the end. When Abel told him to do something, he did it. While others dreamed of the heroine, he always stayed by Abel's side. The princess noticed that Nil and Laurent did not look at each other in a friendly way. She wonders if their relationship is really so bad. Nil kneels down and addresses her highness. He says he's back now. Abel has the records of Lemuria. Nil says that she is the bastard daughter of the emperor. The girl asks if he means that this girl is her sister. Nil says that is exactly what he means. She has only one role in the world of the book, to push the other girls into the background, the other girls around her have no hope of a happy ending. Abel asks when her father plans to pick her up. She thinks that Limeria should stay away from her. Nil asks her highness what is wrong, because she looks very upset in his eyes. He thinks the princess's mood has been affected by the news. But the boy tells her not to worry and that he won't let her suffer. 
Abel thinks he has a look on his face as if he has decided to kill Lemuria. Does he really want the main character to stop glowing? He has exactly the same personality as in the book. She says that's not what she meant. Laron is very concerned for some reason. Abel had a picnic surrounded by Nil and Laron. She looks cautiously at the bodyguard. It turns out that no matter how you look at him, he's handsome. They lock eyes. Laron blushes and turns his head away. This is all happening in front of Nil, of course. And he turns to the princess. He speaks to her a little angrily. Abel is a little afraid because the boy's eyes are really frightening. She is trembling as she drinks her tea. Suddenly, a blue butterfly flies towards her. It sits on her nose, and the girl thinks, what a beautiful creature it is. She tries to catch it, but the butterfly flies away. A whole swarm of butterflies appears around her. They all fly in the same direction. The princess wonders what made them do that. She runs after them, saying she wants to see them, and Nil tries to stop her. The girl runs to the bushes and looks around. There she sees the butterfly again. She goes behind the bushes. She sees a girl surrounded by butterflies. She goes over to her. The girl is much older than Abel. When Abel sees her, he freezes. This girl has medium-length purple hair. She has sky blue eyes. She recognizes her as the main character, and Lemuria greets her highness. Abel thinks that a danger announcement should be made now. Lemuria asks if she likes these beautiful creatures, pointing to the butterflies. The princess wonders if this is the heroine's magic ability. Lemuria finds Abel's reaction very strange and asks what is wrong with her. The princess moves away from the girl and asks how she got here. According to the book, their first meeting would have been at a dinner only a month later. Lemuria says that her father brought her here. She asks sadly if her highness is not happy to meet her. Abel thinks she didn't say that. They try to explain everything. Lemuria asks her if she had no right to come here, and she humbly says that she didn't know. The princess is at a loss for words and doesn't really mean what she says. Abel's servants appear from behind the bushes. Laron says that the garden of the royal palace is not a place where just anyone can go. Lemuria wants to say something about Abel, calling her a lady. And Laron says that the lady is a princess and she can go anywhere in the palace. The princess wonders why he is suddenly defending her. She thinks the atmosphere is becoming tense. Lemuria trembles and tears fall from her eyes. She apologizes and says she shouldn't have come. Abel approaches her and tells her that it's no big deal and asks her to stop crying. Suddenly, she sees the emperor and his bodyguard approaching. She thinks that this will be a scene of sincere feelings between father and daughter. The emperor asks Lemuria why she is here. Abel thinks something has gone wrong. Altver asks again if he didn't order her to stay in her chambers. He passes by her dispassionately, and the girl apologizes. The emperor approaches Abel and kneels before her. He excitedly asks her if she knows everything, and the girl confirms. Altver orders Lemuria not to appear before the princess without his permission. The girl smiles and says she understands. The emperor takes Abel by the hand and tells her to follow him, and the girl looks back at her sister. She waves to them, surrounded by butterflies. From that day on, Lemuria never appeared again, and no one even mentioned her in front of her. It was as if they were deliberately silent. It turned out that her relationship with her father had been strained from the beginning. She doesn't want to think about it anymore and looks at her invitation. The dinner party is in a few days. In the book, a large number of aristocrats attended the dinner party, and representatives from a neighboring realm. It was here that the first princess of Lemuria won universal love. And at the same dinner, the thief Abel thoughtlessly humiliated her in front of everyone. Because of this, she lost the support of the people. The people around her whispered unhappily about it. She does not want to repeat the story. She wants to try to use this chance to get rid of the stigma of being a terrible princess. And above all, she must not come into conflict with Lemuria. She asks Laron what is most important at the dinner party. The boy says that it is dressing up, socializing, and dancing. The girl thinks she doesn't have to worry about dressing up. Nil has also taught her about social etiquette, so she doesn't have to worry about that. There is still dancing to be done. Abel sat up and straightened. She had learned a lot in her previous life. She hopes to use these skills in her next life. She was also a world-class dancer, and now she doesn't even know if her little body can handle it. Laron already has a partner. She has an idea about music and jumps off the chair she was sitting on. She drags Laron to Nil, where Jilmer is also present. She announces to Mr. Nil that her highness has arrived. He asks if she has any business with him. The girl says that she has heard that he can play the piano. The boy watches as she holds Laron's hand. He quickly covers it with his other hand. Neil gives him another unfriendly look. The princess says she wants to practice dancing, but needs an escort and asks if he can help her. The boy asks if the princess would like to dance. The girl says yes in awe. She says there will be a dinner party soon and she doesn't want the emperor to be ashamed of her. For Neil, this is like a knife in the heart. He looks at Laron unkindly and says that in that case, they should definitely practice. Abel points out their difference in height. And Nil realizes that he miscalculated a bit in wanting to be the princess's partner in the dance. He is much taller than her, and Laron is more or less her size. Now he looks at the boy with an even more angry and threatening look. Laron offers the princess his hand and invites her to dance. They hold hands. Nil starts to play the piano. 
and the couple starts to dance. The day of the dinner party has arrived and many carriages arrive at the meeting place. Everyone in the palace has many worries about the upcoming event. Everyone is busy with the final preparations except the princess. Anil knocks on the door of her room and asks to open it. Abel hears only some noises through his sleep. Nil looks at his watch and says that he will be late, but they open the door anyway. The boy tells the maids to start and they slowly approach the princess's bed. They pick up the girl with the blanket. She screams and asks what they are doing. She calls to Nil to save her. The boy says he will wait for her here. Laron is not allowed to enter and stands outside the palace. Lemuria approaches him accompanied by a guard and asks if he is really Sir Liron. The boy asks what she is doing here since her bedroom is far from those of Abel and the Emperor. The girl says that her father, the Emperor, sent her, but her guard reminds her of something. The girl apologizes. She bows to the boy to correct her mistake. The two and the guard simply walk away. The Emperor asks his subjects if everything is ready. He is told yes. Altford takes his daughter by the hand and tells her to come with him. The banquet begins. The ladies say that the first princess who disappeared recently arrived at the palace and was immediately locked in. And the second princess has not been seen since the incident. A lady with a fan asks if it is because she has not lived up to expectations, as if she has become useless without magic. So this dinner party was held to showcase the eldest princess. The door to the hall opens in front of the emperor. Her appearance is publicly announced. Alter and Abel come down the stairs. There's a lot of noise and conversation around them. The princess thinks that her father is indeed a worthy ruler of a great empire when the noise stops in his presence, as if he could kill with a single look. The emperor bows to his daughter and asks her to ignore the opinions of others. The girl thinks that he really cares for her. Although his face is full of blood and cruelty, he is always very gentle with his daughter. Until the end of his days, he never felt anger or hatred toward Abel. This time, she wants him to just let her be his daughter. The emperor says that there are many guests at the dinner party tonight. And besides the fact that Princess Abel is finally on the mend, there is another event to celebrate tonight. He says he has something he wants to present to the community. The first princess, Princess Lemuria. She approaches her sister and father and takes his hand. The people wonder if the rumors about the replacement of the heiress are true. The orchestra plays. The nobles dance and enjoy themselves. Abel seems to be the only one who is really bored. The princess must keep her distance from the others. And all these people are so demonstratively trying to avoid her. If things go on like this, their rescue plan will fail before it even begins. The princess notices that the emperor is being addressed and wonders if something is wrong. Altver approaches Abel and tells her to wait here and that he will be back very soon. It is only a matter of public business and she should not worry. She agrees but thinks that of course it won't be like that when the emperor disappears from sight. The girl jumps down from her throne thinking that such a good chance to show herself should not be lost. After walking around the hall, the girl notices that Lemuria is getting a lot of attention everywhere. She decides not to go with her because the younger princess is recognized everywhere. Her target is found. She notices two ladies chatting. She greets my lady with a little bow. But before she can finish her greeting and look up, she sees that they are no longer there and have quickly disappeared. In this world, being without magic is like being infected with a very contagious disease. She never thought that if the princess was not a magician, she would also be discriminated against. If you continue to live in such an atmosphere, even the best princess will become terrible. The contacts have failed, so it's time to dance. It is time for the Wicked Witch's rescue plan, and the partner did not hesitate. She calls happily to Laron, who has a stony expression as usual, and they meet eyes. The princess quickly approaches him. Abel asks the boy why he has come. The boy answers that Nil told him to come. Nil told him that he had only one job today, to protect the princess, and if he found out that he was free, he did not know what he would do to him. He was very angry because he could not go to dinner. The princess asked him if he would dance with her. She is very anxious to hear the answer. Laron has no choice but to accept. They bow to each other, and the dance begins. The audience says that it turns out that the princess's dancing skills are so good, even better than her teacher's. It turns out that the gossip that the princess learns nothing is false. Abel wonders if Laron is hostile to her. He doesn't seem to mean her any harm. It would be nice to have someone like that on her side. The boy blushes at the sight of the princess. Suddenly their dance is interrupted by Lemuria, who falls right in front of them. Laron thinks the first princess did it on purpose. Abel asks if she's all right, if she slipped, and if she's hurt. She says the ground is so slippery. She calls Lemuria her sister. But others have heard such gossip that they always talk about each other. They say of Lemuria that she grew up outside the palace and cannot even dance. And of Abel, they say that she is simply terrible. And because of jealousy, she has fallen very low. A sister gives her hand to another and asks if she can get up. Lemuria smiled and said that she would do it herself. Thomas Ducret comes to Lemuria's defense and says that this princess, worthy of the emperor's love, is so ruthless that she even wounds her elder sister. She helps the girl to her feet. 
And Laron, as he should have done, begins to defend Princess Abel, asking what he said. Thomas asks how a hostage of low birth dared to open his mouth. He says that dancing with a stranger like him means that the princess is not afraid of disgrace. Laron looks at him with hatred. The emperor appears and asks them what is going on. Abel immediately runs into his father's arms. Altfer asks Thomas who allowed him to speak to his daughter in such an ignorant tone. He says that he does not seem to know the consequences of deteriorating relations with the imperial family. Suddenly, a man runs up to them and calls out to Thomas. He kneels before the emperor, forcibly bending his son's head, and begs his highness to have mercy on him, saying that he did not mean to offend the princess. The emperor says that it turns out to be Ducret's son. He says that they will have to buy the forgiveness of the princess with the blood of all the members of the family. Abel thinks that this is a very bloody and cruel decision. If anyone speaks a harsh word to the princess, he will be punished immediately. The princess decides that something must be done, otherwise she will become an accomplice if things go on like this. Plan A is to be nice. She tells her father that she is finally happy to have him back. But judging by the emperor's dispassionate look, it didn't work. The girl asks if her father is angry with her for disobeying him and not staying put. This was the realization of plan B to flirt. But again, there is no reaction. In plan C, the distraction, Abel says that she is so tired and suggests that they go to rest. Altfer sighs, saying that they can thank the princess for her generosity. He takes the girl in his arms. She walks away. Abel thinks she got away with it this time. But this situation is frightening, and we must do something about it. She piteously asks if her father is angry. The emperor pats her on the head and says that he cannot be angry with her. The girl thinks she is fortunate. The emperor says that from now on, she should not go to such events. But Abel realizes that if she doesn't socialize with others, she won't be able to get rid of the terrible princess label. She says she wants to play with others and asks why she can't. Altver says that when she is happy, she can do whatever she wants. The girl happily asks if this is true. When the daughter finds that it is true, she kisses her father on the cheek and says that she loves her father. Suddenly, the emperor is called. A servant tells him that Duke Vintervise Remfisto and his wife are requesting an audience. They are worried that what has just happened has spoiled the princess's mood and are waiting outside. Abel mentions that Duke Vitoris Christian is her uncle. In the book, The Death of the Thief Abel is linked to this man. The princess wants to think of a way to get rid of him. According to the plot of the book, The Beloved of the Knight of the Empire, it was he who encouraged Abel to kill first his father and then himself. She thinks of every excuse to avoid this meeting. While the girl is thinking, the emperor says that the princess is not well and that they cannot meet now. The princess is touched by these words and accepts them, considering her father a savior. After the order is given, the servants leave the room where the emperor and his daughter were. He informs the guests that the princess is unwell and will not be able to receive them and asks the ducal family to leave. Duke Vintervise kindly says that in this case they will not disturb the princess's rest. Behind his back he looks rather gloomy. There are many passers-by talking and making noise. Nil is helping Abel out of the carriage. They are accompanied by Laron. The girl is very happy to be out of the palace at last. She said she wanted to make friends, and Altver immediately ordered her to invite all the noble girls of her age. And according to the emperor, who knows what will happen to those who do not come to her tea party, Abel thinks that if her dear father behaves like this, she will not be able to make any friends at all. But it was because of this that she was able to get out of the palace. She went out to buy gifts. It was really the first time she had ever been out of the palace. It was so hard for her to get this opportunity, so she must make the most of it. Abel is looking at the display of cakes. The vendor says that she is such a nice young lady and that her cakes are the tastiest in the whole market. She asks how much they cost. The vendor replies 10. But then he looks up. When he sees Nil and Lernan, he gets frightened and says that it is not 10, but 5. He gives the princess some cakes. Nil asks if it is true that there are only 5 coins. The merchant humbly says yes, sweating with excitement. The boys smile good-naturedly. They also bought a teddy bear. Abel felt that everyone looked at her strangely. Suddenly, she noticed a cat by the fountain. The princess crouched down to look at the cat and found it very fascinating. The cat caresses the girl and she thinks what a lovely creature it is. Suddenly a shadow appears in front of Abel and the cat begins to run away. She turns and sees Nil and Lernan. It was them. The girl is offended and walks away through the crowd, but Nil asks her to wait and listen to them. Suddenly Abel begins to run very fast, and the boys run after her. But at one point, when a cart passes between them, the girl disappears from sight. The princess sees that she has finally escaped. Now she feels as old as possible, as if she were 20 years old. What can happen on an ordinary walk? As she walks carelessly through the marketplace, she suddenly bumps into a passerby. She falls to the ground and asks him why he is not looking at the road. The stranger shakes hands with the girl and apologizes if he has offended her. He is wearing a long robe with a hood over his head. He says that he is an astrologer and asks to be allowed to read her future from the stars as an apology. But the princess does not believe in predicting the future by the stars. She says she shouldn't and asks him to be careful on the road. Afterwards, he says, 
My lady is so lonely. He says that the stars of her destiny shine differently from those of an ordinary person. Abel thinks he means that she comes from another world. She is suspicious and wonders who this man is. This man seems very handsome to Abel and resembles the priest in the original story. He gave the girl a handkerchief. The princess thanks him and promises to return it when she has washed it. The boy smiles and says that he lives near. And if she needs him, the girl can always come to him. There is a sign on his house that says it is a fortune-telling room. Abel asks if he really knows how to tell fortunes. The boy replies that he practices astrology. He observes the position of the stars. And of course, he knows how to guess a little. The princess has a strange feeling. The boy says that if she is interested, she can try it. Abel looks around the room. She asks if she can really do it. The boy smiles and says that he can. You enter the mysterious magic workshop together. Abel apologizes for the inconvenience. The boy says he is usually alone here so she can relax. The princess thought there should be someone else in such a big room. The boy asks the girl to tell him her name. The girl invites him to sit down. The princess sits down and tells him her name. She asks excitedly if they have started the process yet. Candles are burning on the table, and the stranger is doing something with his magic ball. The princess looks at the glow of the ball with great intensity. The boy is performing some rituals with the ball that the princess does not understand. Suddenly a crack appears in the magic instrument, and it shatters into pieces. The princess nervously asks if this means she has done something terrible. The crystal ball is shattered and how terrible her crime must be. The stranger is about to speak. Abel is afraid, but thinks he is going to hint at the death penalty. The friend says she is so interesting. The girl wonders what this means and if he is not going to tell her about her death. The boy says that someone put a ban on it. Abel asks what it means. He says that the ball is split because someone put a spell on it and he can't read it. Abel asks who put the spell and why. The boy says he doesn't know, but most likely it was done to protect them. But there may be another reason, which he doesn't know. The princess says that she only wanted to read for fun and did not even realize that the reading would be bad and that they would learn of the prohibition imposed on her. Suddenly, the boy sits down very close to Abel. She asks what it means and tries to push him away. He says it is a curse that has been placed upon her. He looks very familiar. Outwardly, everything seems normal. But inside, Abel is screaming for someone to save her from this man. At this point, a third person enters the room. The princess and the stranger immediately notice the newcomer. It is none other than Leron, and he tells them to take their dirty hands off the princess immediately. Leron walks confidently across the room. The princess is shocked to see him here. She approaches her bodyguard. She asks him nicely how he found her. The boy apologizes to her highness for not being able to protect her. The girl says that this is not true at all, and that it was she who gave in to her feelings and ran away. She thinks that if she had not done so, her meeting with the boy would not have happened. Leron asks the princess who was beside her. The wizard just sits there smiling, and Leron continues to look at him with an angry look. The boy pretends to be innocent and says that he is an ordinary astrologer, and he reminds him that he is in his house. The princess wonders in what place he is an ordinary astrologer. Suddenly, Leron changes his mood very abruptly and apologizes for the intrusion and thanks him for taking care of his lady. But he says that it is time for her to return. He takes Abel's hand. The astrologer just laughs. He bows down a little and says he thinks he has disturbed the lady with some actions. He gives the princess a jewel in a red box and asks her to accept it as an apology. He thinks the lady will like the necklace. And Leron continues to watch this astrologer. Abel pushed the box of jewelry away, saying that it was not necessary, and thanked him for offering to accept the gift. Leron quietly tells the princess that it is time to leave. They leave the wizard's room together. The wizard thinks that the girl will need these jewels. And the necklace disappears from its box. Leron and Abel walk down the market street. Suddenly, the boy apologizes to the princess. As the princess's protector, he can't take care of her safety. He bows down and says that he has made a grave mistake and asks to be punished. Abel begins to reassure the boy, telling him that everything is all right. She smiles and says that he has come at the right time. Now, the princess can think of nothing but the magician's words that she is under a ban. But what did he mean when he said that he knew her? Suddenly, Nil runs toward them. He says they finally found her and asks if she is okay. The girl says that she is fine and apologizes for worrying you. Nil suggests they go back. The princess turns to him and says that he knows better than anyone. But she thinks it would be better to ask what she wants when they return. Abel says that they have bought gifts and can go back. And she feels strangely disappointed. Today, Abel is very tired and has finally come home. Gifts, sweets, just choose a decoration and everything is almost ready. The princess hopes that everything will go well tomorrow and goes to bed. As she closes her eyes, a bright light appears before her. She sees a woman standing before her, radiant. Abel does not recognize who she is. This beautiful woman has a smile on her face that is like her own, a subtle and calm smile. The princess is nervous and looks at her with an open mouth. And this woman knows her name. Abel is very frightened and asks the woman who she is. She says that the penalty for breaking into the princess's room is death. The woman does not answer, but stretches out her hand to the princess. The girl wonders how this lady could get into her room, 
She must be an unusual person, and why should she be here? Is she a murderer? The woman is gently touching her hair. The princess asks what she is doing. The woman begins to walk away, and Abel asks her to wait. But at this moment, Nil enters the room almost without knocking, and asks why she is still awake. The boy says he heard the princess's voice as he passed the room. Abel looks around and sees that the woman is gone. Nil asks if she had a nightmare, and the girl continues to think about what happened. Abel says she's fine and tells her to go back to bed. The boy says he can stand guard outside her room, and if she is worried about anything, she should call him immediately. As the boy leaves the room, the princess continues to think about the woman and whether she will ever return. The princess did not sleep well that night. Jilmer tells her highness that she knew what day it was, but she still couldn't sleep. The princess says she didn't mean to. She stayed up all night thinking about the mysterious woman. Nil also stayed up all night like her. He stood outside her room all the time. But he looks full of energy and you wouldn't know it. The maid tells her highness that everything is ready and the tea party can begin at any time. The princess asks if everything is ready. The way the girl imagined the tea party, somewhat different from what it really is. The tea party guests sit two chairs away from Abel. The princess wonders if everything she did at the ball had no effect. Suddenly a girl arrives late and apologizes for being late. She asks to sit next to the princess. Abel happily says that she can sit here. The girl smiles and says, thank you. All the girls present are surprised to see this. Abel asks the girl next to him in his ear why she doesn't avoid him. The girl replies by asking if she should. Abel says that everyone thinks she is spoiled and moody. The neighbor at the table asks if she is. And when she says no, he says it is to be expected. Abel says that she has no magical powers at all, and she is a little upset to think of it. And this has happened to her in a world where magic is impossible. And the girl just asks, what's the use? A very friendly atmosphere developed between the two girls, but one of the girls in the company is not looking at her very friendly. Lemuria suggests starting the tea party when the last guest has arrived. Abel doesn't like the fact that this girl, whose name is Lefea, pretends to be the hostess of the tea party. He will not let her get away with it. At least one person will be on her side. The princess gestures to her maid, Hetty. The obedient servant immediately understands and claps her hands. The other servants, hearing the sign, bring many gifts. Each girl is given a box of her own, dressed for the occasion. The girl nearest the princess asks her highness what it is. The princess says they are gifts she has prepared for them. And she thanks them for accepting the invitation to this humble tea party. The invited girls exchange glances. Abel kindly asks them to accept the gifts. The audience is shocked at this development. The princess wonders if they will not even accept the gifts from her. The girl, who has almost become a friend of the princess, opens her gift first. Inside, she sees a very beautiful whip with a red handle decorated with a red stone. The princess says that she is the daughter of General Azteca and that she has been trained in martial arts since childhood. And as far as the princess knows, she prefers the whip as a weapon. Abel thinks that this whip, decorated with precious rubies, will be perfect for Lady Blur. One girl asks how such a thing could be given to a noble lady. Another says that the rumor that the procession has no manners at all is true. Blur says she likes this gift very much. Abel happily asks if it is true. The girl thanks her highness for the wonderful gift. The other girl opens the gift and sees the book she has been looking for. Another sees jewelry in the box that can only be found in a neighboring country and that she has been longing to get. The princess is very pleased that they like the gifts and thinks that her efforts to learn about each of them have not been in vain. Only Lemuria sits there looking gloomy. Abel asks her if she doesn't want to see what the princess has prepared for her. Lemuria replies that there is no need, and she is sure that her dear sister's gift is beyond praise. Abel says that he never neglects his sister. All the girls are very pleased with their gifts. The princess thinks it is wonderful. After a little observation, these ladies seem very elegant to the princess. The gifts helped reduce her wariness of them. She has worked hard today and hopes to destroy any preconceptions about her that might lead her astray. A cup of tea is spilled on the table during a conversation. The princess orders Hetty to see if Lady Vilfred is hurt. The girl apologizes for nearly disrupting the tea party as the maid wipes the tea from the tablecloth. Abel tells Lady Wilfred that everything is all right and asks if she is well. The girl smiles and thanks her highness. A girl asks Wilfred, who has been given the book by the princess, to ask the princess something. Lady Vilfred is worried, but the girl says that everything will be fine and that she is just curious. Wilfred approaches her highness and thanks her for the gift saying that he will treasure it as much as his own eyes. The princess is pleased to hear that the lady likes her gift. The girl asks her highness if she has read this book before. Abel is a little frozen and does not know what to say. Wilfred says she never thought her highness would be so interested in books. The princess wants to stop them talking nonstop. She's ashamed to admit that she hasn't read the book yet. Blair tells Wilfred that this is disrespectful to her highness. She has just turned 12 and her education has begun with basic books. A girl says that, Philosophy of Graphical Theory and Logic is a very difficult book. Of course, Her Highness is not wise beyond her years. But even for her, it is a very difficult book. 
She started with books that were not so difficult, but she still cannot understand philosophy of graphical theory and logic. She thinks it is normal that Her Highness has not read it. Abel sees that they all support her, and it is simply incredible. Wilfred apologizes sincerely for his ignorance. The princess says that it is all right, and that she does not have to apologize. It is she who needs to study more. She breathes a sigh of relief. Wilfred thanks her for her apology. The girl tells Her Highness that she is so kind. She asks how far the princess has come in her studies. Abel is a little surprised that they keep talking about studying. She thinks that Wilfred must be a scholar. A lady says that her sister is a year older than Her Highness, and that she has recently finished the Ephitic records. She says that Her Highness is probably going through them now. But these two words are very strange to the princess. The princess is asked if she is really going through this particular material. Abel thinks that her social position will drive her into a ditch. She began to study etiquette and did not study the books of which they spoke. She hesitates to tell the truth that she has not yet begun to study these books. But if she did, it would be like accepting the title of princess, which is useless. The ladies continued on this subject, and the princess became quite uncomfortable. But if they find out that she is lying, her reputation will be ruined. She decides to tell the truth. But she's cut off in mid-sentence. Lemuria says that Her Highness has studied the last chapter of the phenomenology of the Ferromero theory. And her teacher praised Her Highness as the most intelligent student. All the ladies praise the princess, and she wonders why Lemuria helps her. A girl asks Her Highness if Lemuria is also in the last chapter. Lemuria says that she had more access to the material than Her Highness. But unlike her, she is not as smart, so now she is studying the Sipen ideology. A lady says that her brother has just begun to study the Sipen ideology. Lemuria says that it is very complicated, and it took her two months to learn it completely. She suggests that it will take Her Highness only half that time. Abel tells his sister that she's also very intelligent and hopes to help her learn this ideology. The girls talk about the book, and Abel doesn't understand it at all, but she enjoys it anyway. She realizes that she must study more. The next day, she begins to study hard. She thinks she's been too careless. She concentrated on dancing and etiquette, forgetting that being a princess is not only about looks and manners. Lemuria has been away from the palace for a long time and knows how to communicate with people, but she could only watch from the outside. She needed someone to help her. In her past life, she had always been the center of such gatherings. She decides to set things right. The princess tells Nil to bring her all the materials of a higher level, and the more the better. But the boy is afraid that they will be too heavy for her. The girl says that she must become a perfect princess. Nil tries to convince her of her words. But she goes away, saying she will try her best. To become a perfect princess and get rid of the stigma of being trash. And she will learn all that a princess should know. Even things beyond her knowledge. And only then will she officially become a princess worthy of this realm. And she will take her destiny into her own hands. One day Abel sat under a tree and read a book. Nil coming up reminded him that it was time to go. The princess put down the book. She promised to go now. The girl was now 14 years old and she was becoming more like a grown-up girl. Another celebration is held in the palace. Her Highness is 14 years old. Many have heard that she has been studying hard lately, and hardly anyone has seen her lately. They announce the arrival of His Highness, the son of the Empire, the Emperor, and Her Imperial Highness Abel, and Her Imperial Highness Lemuria. Long live the son of the Empire. Welcome His Highness. Welcome Her Highness Princess Abel. Welcome Her Highness Princess Lemuria. The entire audience bows before the imperial family. The emperor announces that tonight's ball is dedicated to Princess Abel's 14th birthday and that everyone is welcome to enjoy the festivities. He tells the birthday girl to go and enjoy herself. Lemuria tells his highness that she will take care of her sister. All the gentlemen wish her highness a happy birthday and give her gifts and compliments. The princess thanks them for coming to the ball and promises to take care of their gifts. Lemuria sees her sister's embarrassment at the excessive attention. But another sister comes to the girl's rescue. Lemuria says the orchestra is about to start, and she promised her first dance. Abel apologizes to the crowd of fans and says she should probably go. The orchestra actually begins to play the best ballroom music. The girls begin to dance in pairs. Everyone looks at this debut with admiration, as expected from princesses. Although someone wanted to ask the princess to give her first dance, Abel tells Lemuria that there are at least six men who want to dance with her. Lemuria says that she was surprised when the princess asked her to be her partner for the first dance. Abel wonders if there was something else that could have kept her in place. Lemuria tells her sister that she also helped her get rid of stubborn partners. After Lemuria helped Abel avoid embarrassment at the tea party, they became very close. She was much smarter than she thought. It seems that because of her childhood, she does not know how to say no. If Abel hadn't asked her sister to dance with him, she wouldn't have been able to say no to everyone who wanted to dance with her. At the end of the dance, the girls bow to each other and smile sweetly. Suddenly, a man unknown to the princesses, who has been watching their behavior in the hall for a long time, begins to clap his hands. He says that it was simply amazing. He is greeted as Vintervise Remphisto. 
Lemuria bows and tells the Duke that she is glad to see him again. Abel asks his name a little excitedly. The Duke tells her that she is right. The Duke of Winterweiss is the Emperor's younger brother. Gentle, elegant, and courteous, he helped the main characters of the novel more than once. He saw Abel trying to poison the Emperor and immediately sent her to the guillotine. Now she realizes that he is a dangerous character. The Duke asks Her Highness what is wrong. She says she was only surprised. Winterweiss says that they really haven't seen each other for a long time. The princess says that she has been too busy studying to see him. After the last banquet, he wanted to meet her, but her father refused. By the way, it was he who brought back the Lemuria. She says that she liked the book his lordship sent her very much, but she is afraid it is too heavy for her, and she has not yet read it. The duke tells her highness that it is all right, and that she may take her time and study it slowly. For some reason, Abel thinks they speak a strange language. Vinterweiss says that today is her highness's birthday, so he won't bother her anymore. So he leaves them. But finally, he says that his present has already been delivered to Her Highness's room, and he hopes she likes the surprise. Abel also bids him farewell politely. She thinks he has gone for good, because talking to him is too tiring. For Abel, the evening is finally over and she is free to go to bed. Nil informs Her Highness that her gifts have not yet been opened, and she has given many gifts. She asks Laron and Jilmer to come and open them together. The maid notices the necklace that the lady seems to have mentioned as her present. Nil says that it was a gift from Lady Vilfred. Holding one of the gifts in his hands, Abel asks if it is from the Lorenge family. Nil confirms that it is. Jilmer holds up one of the gifts and says that it is a very beautiful jewel. Laron says that it belongs to the temple and is called a sacred stone. Looking at the list again, Nil says that it is a gift from the Duke in Vinterweiss. Abel asks what he meant by giving it to her. Nil heard that the day the Duke brought back Princess Lemuria, His Highness wanted to give him a reward, but he had asked for the Holy Stone, and he did not think that His Highness would give it so easily. Abel says that it doesn't matter, and they will deal with it later, and she asks Haiti to put it in the desk drawer. There were a lot of gifts, and writing back to everyone with thank you notes caused a lot of trouble. So Abel decided to just pick the most important ones and reply to them. While writing the letters, the princess noticed that her desk drawer was shining. To understand what was going on, she looked inside and saw the same sacred stone. The glow also comes from the bookshelf. After putting the books away a bit, she sees a well the size of this stone. The sacred stone given by the duke turned out to be a key. As Abel puts the key back in, he hears a click inside. The glow becomes even brighter, so much so that the princess has to cover her face. Suddenly the bookcase begins to move, and it opens the passage to the dungeon. This is a secret hidden room. Is this a joke? The girl steps onto one of the steps leading down. Fortunately, the lanterns are burning and light the way for the princess. The stairs lead to a large locked door. She touches it lightly and thinks that this place is... She has seen it before. The door begins to creak and the princess sees a room with a table in the middle. The first thing the girl notices on the table is a book about the study of holy power. Most people are born with either magical or sacred power. Holy power is different because it is weaker and less common. Because of their background, royalty and nobility usually have very strong magical powers. There are also people among the common people who have strong magical or holy powers. Those with magical powers are called wizards and warriors. But those who are endowed with holy powers must be trained and tested to become temple servants. Most of the texts in this room are related to religious studies. Abel wonders if this place might have something to do with the temple. Suddenly she notices a bright yellow stone on the table. She picks it up to find out what it is. And just then the stone begins to glow in her hands. From this stone appears a projection of the same woman she had seen in her bedroom before going to sleep. She calls Abel her child. And the princess asks very uncertainly if she is her mother. The woman touches Abel's cheek and wishes her child a happy birthday. The princess feels very strange. She tries to touch the projection and feels so sad because it seems to be only an image of her. The woman says that she has sealed a part of her soul in this stone. The mother pats her daughter on the head and tells her not to be sad. For when she found this place, she was already 14 years old. She is sorry that she could not see her child grow up in person. The woman suggests that Abel must have had many questions since he came here, and it is time to give him some answers. It was time for the princess to know everything. Jilmer asks Her Highness if something is bothering the girl, but when Abel does not answer, the maid asks again. The girl says that nothing much has happened. Jilmer asks her to tell her if anything is bothering the princess, and she will try to lighten her load. Abel says that everything is fine, and that she is just a little tired. The maid says that in that case she should get more rest, and if the princess needs anything, she can call her. She covers the girl with a blanket, and Abel thanks Haiti. The maid says it is her duty, and she should not thank her. As she leaves, she says that she hopes the princess will have sweet dreams. At night, the princess suddenly opens her eyes and awakes from her sleep. She suddenly takes a sitting position. She looks under the bed where the book is. Abel's mother was a temple saint. Even before the girl was born, 
She felt an incredible magical power emanating from her and vague traces of holy power. She looked into the future and realized that she could not be with her daughter. She saw that the girl would be the first person in the world to possess both magical and sacred powers. She knew that this power would bring her many dangers, so she left these books and treasures behind. On the day of her 14th birthday, she would be able to open this door. The mother wants her daughter to be strong enough to protect herself. The woman told Abel that she had sealed her powers to protect her. In other words, it's not that Abel doesn't have magical powers, but that they have been sealed away. The girl immediately thinks of the magician in the marketplace. Now she understands what he was talking about. The prohibition he was talking about must be a seal put on by her mother. Suddenly through the door, her highness is asked if she is still awake. Anyway, she decides to think about it later and puts down the book. Now it is time for bed. Meanwhile, a subordinate comes to see his master. Abel is sitting at the dining table. She has spent all these days looking for a way to remove the seal, but the search was unsuccessful. The emperor sits beside the girl and sees that his daughter is worried about something. He asked her if anything was wrong. Abel says that everything is fine. She just didn't sleep well last night. Altver says that she and Lemuria are going to study at the Imperial Academy tomorrow. Abel asks why so early, considering how far the story has progressed. The Emperor says that she is at an age where she should study more. He tells Lemuria that she must take care of her younger sister. She promises to take good care of Abel. The Emperor gets up and says that he hopes so. He pats Abel on the head and tells her that if she is tired, she can rest, and then ask Nil to help her pack. Nil and Jilmer are busy packing the princess's things. Abel says that she really won't need so many things at the Academy, but the servants disagree. Nil says that her highness's luggage must be fully prepared. Jilmer will not allow her highness to be bored with anything. Abel looks at Leron. She asks if he will accompany her to the academy as her bodyguard. The boy says that his highness has ordered him to see to the safety of the princess. Abel asks where his luggage is and if he has packed it. Leron points to his sword and says that his baggage is already here. Abel thinks he has strange luggage. She goes to her bags, checking that everything is in place. She says they can take care of Leron's luggage now. Nil asks her highness to just tell him what to pack and she doesn't have to worry about it personally. The princess says he shouldn't worry about such trifles. She's a princess and it is her duty to take care of her surroundings. Laron bows and says thank you. The princess smiles and says, you're welcome. Everyone stands together in the street. Abel asks if they are not supposed to be going to the academy and why they are all here. Lemuria replies that the temple has expressed its desire to bless their journey, so they are waiting for them. Immediately after this brief conversation, the arrival of the temple priests is announced, and Abel saw a group of men in blue robes approaching them. For the glory of the empire, they welcome the descendants of the sun, his imperial highness and their imperial highnesses. The company bows, and may the light of God not be extinguished from the realm. A priest says it is a long time since he has seen the princesses and they have grown much. Lemuria bows and thanks his high priesthood, Bishop Winston, and Abel wonders if she has met him before. A sister indicates to another sister that she should also pray. Abel is a little frozen at first, but then she bowed in thanksgiving. Lemuria resembles the name of this bishop. She thanked him for his care. The man says that they had not seen each other for so long that perhaps Princess Abel had forgotten him. She had only seen him when she was reborn. In all these years, he has never appeared, and he is hardly mentioned in the novel, so how could she know him? The emperor orders the bishop to hurry up and get started. Winston obeys his highness. Abel is frightened by the bishop's gaze. The priest takes his sacred attribute, the scepter. He approaches Abel and asks her to close her eyes. Let the dawn break and God will take the side of the princess and protect her. Abel thinks that something strange has just happened. Winston asks her what has happened and if she is unwell. Laron is also concerned about her highness and asks if she should go back and rest. Abel says that she is well. Nil says it must be because her body has no magical power. It could have counteracted the sacred power directed at her during the blessing, and that is why she is sick. Winston bows and apologizes, saying he was too careless. The emperor approaches his daughter who addresses Winston. He asks when the temple became so bold. In defense of the bishop, other priests stand between him and the emperor. Abel tells his father that she is well, and perhaps his lordship is right, and it is her weak body that is to blame. Lemuria asks if she is really well, but the emperor is not reassured by these words. Abel speaks to his father as if to point out his excessively harsh attitude toward the priest. Altver simply sighs. She asks if the so-called blessing is over. Winston says it is. The emperor tells his daughters they may go, and to Lernan he tells him to guard the princess Abel very well. The bishop tells his highness that he asks, by way of apology, that the son of the temple be allowed to accompany the princesses during their studies at the academy. The son of the temple is the same protagonist, and Abel thinks that he might have forgotten him. And by the way, she was very stunned when they came in. This fellow looks very much like the astrologer from the market. The Pagolite Levite greets his imperial highness and their highnesses. From this name, Abel realizes that he is definitely the main character of the novel. If the hero has already appeared, 
It may mean that his death is near. The emperor agrees to the bishop's proposal. Abel wonders what else it means, and doesn't he know that this guy is actually one of the people responsible for his daughter's death? Abel asks his daughter if she doesn't like the apology. The girl says she doesn't, and just the thought of leaving makes her sad. Alver says the three years will fly by and she will be back home before she knows it. The girl remembers that the story of her death is supposed to take place after she graduates from the academy. But for now, she can breathe easy. That's how they said goodbye. Lernan drives the carriage. The princesses are inside with Pagolite. Abel thinks that finally there is silence. And fortunately, it has prevented the Order of Chivalry from accompanying them. She doesn't want to attract too much attention at the academy. Lemuria asks Abel if it is true that she refused to allow the knights to accompany her. And the princess changes the subject, saying that she will always have to follow etiquette. And she wants to rest one last time, leaning on her sister's shoulder. Lemuria reminds her that they are not alone. Remembering this, Abel suddenly gets up. Does Sir Holy Knight know about the House of Divine Magic? The princess asked him. The boy wonders why her highness is asking so unexpectedly. Abel wants to make sure she is not mistaking the man. She says the Holy Knight looks suspiciously like someone she met there. Lemuria asks what happened. Abel replies that she was very surprised. There were many descriptions of the main character in the novel. In the temple, he was subordinate to only one person. All the officials of the temple called him cold and heartless. They said that, as a god, he was incapable of feeling. That was until he met the main character, Lefe Larousse. The holy son of the temple, who had never known emotion, learns a new emotion. He could cry, laugh, and get angry again. He became what he had not been before. As Abel read the novel, she was touched by the following moments. Even though the boy she met that day was so sweet and kind. Not like Pagolite. He has a face like a piece of ice. Abel says she probably just thinks too much about that day. Pegalite asks if the person her highness is talking about is an astrologer. The princess asks if he really knows him. The holy knight says that it is only a guess and that he should think about it. He says that there are many people of similar appearance and that her highness need not be so surprised. Abel says that she thinks too much and she feels that Lemuria knows Pagolite. Her highness announces that they have reached the city. It is the city of Enstein. Abel asks if this is the teleportation point to the academy. The company decided to have a snack. Abel really hopes that Leron and Pagolite didn't fight. She thinks they might have had a little argument about sleeping arrangements. Or maybe they both found the bed comfortable, so they lay down together. But how did she arrive at this conclusion? A fork falls from the girl's hand. Pagolite asks her highness to concentrate on the food. Laren says he doesn't know what's on her mind, but it would be nice to stop the silly fantasies. The girl says she was just curious about how they shared the bed. Laron asks if there were two beds. He says they slept separately. Avil is surprised that this is true. Pagolite asked the owner, and he said that there was only a big and a small room. They gave the large room to the princess and asked for another bed in the small room. Abel asked Lemuria if she knew about it. The girl answered that she knew, but she did not know that she had not been told. Abel says that she was so worried about the situation. Her sister tries to reassure her and offers to try a dish that she is sure she has never had before. The dish is very similar to a steamed meat dumpling that Abel had in her former life. She didn't think she would be able to taste her native food in a fantasy world made to suit European tastes. But when she tastes it, it seems very tasty. Abel is surprised to see so many people on the road. She asks her sister why. Lemuria answers that the Imperial Academy is one of the best on the continent. And it is natural that many people dream of studying there. Abel asks if they have to stand in line to get in. Lernan informs Her Highness that the Imperial family has a personal teleportation point that leads to the Academy. Abel agrees that the Imperial family should have their own privileges. She thinks that having money and power is pretty damn cool. Abel is the first to step onto the teleport, and the four of them begin the transfer. The man accompanying them hopes that their Highnesses will have a busy school life. When they arrive, they see before them a huge school resembling a castle. The gate of the Imperial Academy is very crowded. The princess asks if this is the Academy. Suddenly, someone behind them asks what they are staring at and calls them peasants. The party turns towards the noise. Someone says that the Imperial Academy is not for scum like them. Abel asks Lemuria if he is also a student at the Academy. She replies that she doesn't know, but she doesn't think he is. Ignoring this person, Laron suddenly turns to her highness and tells her that he should enroll as soon as possible. Abel agrees to be ignored and agrees to leave as they begin to walk in the opposite direction of the man. He asks Laron if he is the cursed child with black hair and red eyes. Abel can't take it anymore and asks what he just said. Laron tells her highness not to pay any attention to him. The boy asks if he wants to know what it means to be a cursed child, born with black hair. Abel asks what the boy means. Pagolite says it looks like he's targeting Liron. The princess sternly tells him to be clear about what he means. The man asks what he should say. He says he's just a caring person who can't stand the thought of being destroyed by a curse. He says that the man next to her is a monster who took his own mother's life. And if she wants to live, she must stay away from him. 
Abel asks if he is just a cowardly, inferior bastard who asserts himself by humiliating others. He asks what she has just said. Abel says in Lemuria's ear that he is so strange. Seemingly shy and so jealous of Laron's appearance, he asks her again what she is saying, but she says he can't hear her. Abel tells Lemuria to hurry up and leave because she thought he was going to say something important. She asks what will happen if his cowardice is contagious. This makes the boy very angry. The guard grabs the boy and asks Her Highness not to be so careless. The boy shouts that they should not stop him because he must show them who is in charge. One of the guards says that this girl looks like a princess of the Remfisto Empire. This surprises the boy. Abel asks Lernan why he's frozen and suggests that they leave as soon as possible. Lernan comes to his senses and follows them. Pegalite looks at them and finds it all very interesting. Walking through the corridors of the academy, the princesses talk and have a lot of fun. Abel notices that Laron is thinking about something and looks worried. She asks him what is wrong. The boy asks her highness if she is not afraid of him. Abel asks why she should be afraid of him. The boy says she should be afraid of his curse. He will bring her misfortune. The princess says that it is only because he was born with this appearance that he is considered the victim of a curse. Laron says that this is true. Lemuria says that there are very few people with black hair on the continent, and she thinks that is one of the reasons for this statement. Pagolite says that this is just an unfounded statement. Was Abel's past world full of victims of the curse? There was no information about Lerona in the novel before Abel sent him back to his land. The princess's heart breaks at the memory. She asks the boy to lower his head a little. Venus strokes his hair and tells him that everything is all right. The princess says they are just a bunch of fools who think black hair is a curse. She says that according to this logic, Lemuria's blonde hair means that she is an angel, and her beloved messenger leader is an archangel. Lemuria smiles and says that only Abel would say such things. The girl says it is true. Pagolite asks who her highness is. Lemuria and Abel look at each other and do not know what to say to this question. So Laron does it for them, saying that she is his goddess of luck. Lemuria is fascinated by this image, as if it were a new love affair. Laron and Abel look away from each other, trying to get out of the awkward situation. The man says that they are late for the shoot and must hurry. Abel thinks it was a real thing, and why their heart is beating so fast. Pegalite thinks it will happen soon. Abel asks if this is the place of registration. She goes to the registration desk and says they are here to fill out applications. The man in charge of registration gives her forms to fill out. The other members of the company are also given forms. Lernan has found an empty seat at the table and calls everyone together. Once everyone is seated, they begin to fill out the questionnaires. In the direction column, Abel indicated that she wanted to be a warrior mage. She asks her friends what direction they have chosen. Laron closes his pen and says that he has chosen the warrior path. And Lemuria has chosen the magical way. Abel tells Laron that as far as she remembers, he also has magical powers, so she asks why he didn't choose the magical path. Isn't the position of a magician higher than that of a soldier? As for his powers, the boy says it is better not to use them. Abel thinks that his power will only make the rumors of the curse worse. She decides to join the military as well, immediately changing her answer on the application form. On the way down the street, Lernan tells Her Highness that she should have chosen the magical path, but Abel asks if he doesn't think that would be very strange, since she has no magical powers at all. She asks if he won't be lonely in the end if they all choose the magical path. Lernan says he is willing to sacrifice himself. Abel says that although she has a higher position than the magicians, she doesn't have a drop of magical power. She would be in an extremely awkward position, so she has chosen the warrior's way. But Lemuria says that with her in the magical direction, no one could intimidate Abel. Pegalite announces that they have arrived where they were going. They are at a fork in the road. It seems to be time for them to part. Lemuria says that all is well, and at least they are studying at the same academy. So they will meet sooner or later. Pegalite suggests that they meet at the freshman orientation. Abel says goodbye to everyone. When she arrives at the recreation center, she finds her room. She opens the door and immediately apologizes. She sees three girls in the room, each doing something different. Abel smiles in greeting. One of the girls is blur and they recognize each other immediately. One of the girls asks if this is the useless princess. The girls greet each other. This meeting was unexpected for them. A girl named Mara called the princess useless. Blair hinted that this was not a good thing to say. Mara asked what was wrong with her since she had no magical powers and what was the point of going to the academy. Abel says that just because she doesn't have magic doesn't mean she can't study here. The academy not only teaches magic, but she can also learn fencing and strategy. Mara doesn't say anything, but remembers that she was late with her presentation. The girl says that her name is Mara Marshall. Pointing to a blue-eyed blonde with a braid and a modest dress, she says that her name is Mary Leon. Blair also says her name. And Abel follows, saying that she's pleased to meet them. On the day of assignment, all the freshmen are welcome to the academy. For several years, they will increase their knowledge. Moira asks how long he will be crucified. Mary says it is not polite to say that. 
the three girls and Lernan are sitting together. As expected, his roommates didn't want to hang out with him because of his curse. In the end, he just decided to sit with them. Moira is so bored with this ceremony that she doesn't know where to sit and asks how long the speaker will be speaking. Abel says it's still early, and after the headmaster's meeting, there are speeches from the first-year representatives of the mage and warrior departments. Fortunately, her roommates don't care about Laurent's hair color. She had introduced them to a guy a little earlier. And the girls didn't seem to mind the introduction. Moira is very happy to clap her hands when the speech is finally over. And a representative of the first year of the magic department is invited to the department. Moira asks who she thinks the representative is, but she has no idea. A young freshman with blonde hair tied in a bow greets the students. She's a stranger to most, but one already knows Lemaria Remphisto. Moira says this girl looks like a goddess and her surname is Remphisto. So is this the princess they found some years ago? Abel confirms this, but thinks that as expected from the main character, all the attention is on her. Suddenly, Blur says that she has to go away for a while. Abel thinks she has to go to the bathroom, but decides to ask later. Laurent says that there is still a speech by the representative of the military department and that it will start soon. And now he is greeted. Moira recognizes the man at once. Abel also recognizes him. Blur's name is called from the pulpit and she stands before all. The assignment is over and the freshmen can go to their classes. Moira tells Blur that they agreed to get bad grades and she ends up in the best class. Princess also says it's a bit unfair. Blur thinks they know everything. The girl says that she is the daughter of General Aztica. Moira says it is true. In the novel, General Azteca was called the God of War. He had perfect abilities. His children inherited these skills. When Abel and Blear first met, the princess already knew, but she hadn't expected the girl to be so talented. Lernan asks the princess what grade she is in. The girls look at their report cards. It turns out that Lernan, Blur, and Mary are in class A. Moira and Abel are in class F. Moira and Abel say that all the girls live in the same room, and they don't understand why it happened that way, and they are in the worst class. The Imperial Academy does not only have a highly qualified faculty, it also has a system of rivalry, and the class is the best. Class B is the elite, class C is the high class, D is the middle class, E is the lowest class, and the last class is F, and it is located on a rock in a separate building, unlike the other classes that are located in the Academy itself. Moira says that this cannot be, and how can a noble lady like her be in the worst class? Abel also doesn't understand why she, as a princess, has been put in the worst class and so she reassures Moira. The class teacher for this class is Billy Potter Eric. He asks the students in the worst class to pay attention to him. Abel thinks that even if they are the worst class, there is no need to remind them of it. Moira is very angry at this sentence and asks why he says it. Abel tries to calm the girl down. The teacher asks if he said something wrong because they are just a bunch of talentless, weak, useless students. He says that if they want to prove that they are worthy of more, they should climb to the top. He says that this will be the first lesson the disciples are looking at this large mountain. Abel asks if it is real. Moira says they have to do it. She says she doesn't want this teacher to look down on her. A small round camera with wings flies up to them. The device addresses them as beloved failing students. It is up to them whether they will remain losers or at least get a student pass. The teacher reminds them that they may not leave the academy without this pass. They probably won't last long without it. The teacher communicates with them from the classroom through this device. The students become visibly nervous. Moira says she finds it very disgusting. Abel thinks they should split into teams, and she can't believe it's even possible to climb this peak, but she's trying hard. The teacher tells the students to start the challenge. They all began to run quickly into the mountain mist. Abel climbs the rock first. This gives inspiration and encouragement to the other disciples. They also begin to climb. A girl's foot slips, but she is caught by Abel and Moira, who were already on the mountain, so they help the others. Billy watches them through his device. Looks like there's someone else down there. On the other side, the students begin calling out to another student named Cheryl. Abel asks for help. She notices the girl. Abel says it looks like she sprained her ankle and asks if anyone has healing magic. A man in the crowd says he can. He begins to heal Cheryl. He says the pain will pass for now, but later they should rest. Cheryl says she can't stand it anymore. She wipes away tears and asks if this is a waste of time, saying that she is of no use. Moira slaps her cheek. Tuck tells her to say those words again. Moira asks again if she can do it again. Abel quickly approaches Moira and asks if it was necessary. The other girls approach Cheryl and ask how she is. Moira says that if she doesn't mind being called garbage, she can do it for the rest of her life. Abel tries to revive the girl, but Abel doesn't remember this happening in the story. There, Abel and Moira quarrel over different points of view. As a result, Abel befriends a like-minded woman named Cheryl. But in the end, when the cause of the emperor's death was discovered, she named Abel as the murderer. The novel reveals the reason for this behavior. Moira was born as the second daughter of the Marshall family. Everyone considered her spoiled, capricious, and their own, but her level of magical power was very low. 
She was not as powerful as her older sister. Not as beautiful. She did not receive enough love and preferred to be alone. This made her arrogant and selfish. The situations of Abel in the novel and of Moira are very similar. After Lemuria's return, Abel only receded into the background with each passing day. Both were unloved and both hated the same word. And that word was trash. Abel asks Cheryl and her friend if they know what kind of person really deserves to be called trash. She says it is the person who thinks he is. This gets the girls thinking. Moira asks Abel why she is here. Abel says with a combative attitude that she is here to work hard, not to be called trash. This is very uplifting for the group, and they realize that they are not all the trash they are thought to be. The teacher continues to keep a close eye on all this. The students have only one purpose, and that is the summit. Everyone is happy to have reached the top, a view of the setting sun. The other members of the group hurry to cast their shadows. Perhaps it is because of the slap that no one gives up. After falling, they come to their feet. Perhaps they are not so talented. Perhaps their personalities are not perfect. But they made it, they survived. They are tired, but happy. One of the girls asks for attention. The sun is beautiful and bright. A teacher approaches them. He tells them that they are not full of garbage. The students are visibly frightened to see him. Billy tells them not to be so nervous and that their first lesson is over. He gives Abel a small bottle, tells him they will each have one, and tells him to take a bath when they return. He warns that it is very expensive. Moira asks Abel what he has given her. Abel reminds her that he said he would give each of them a bottle, but there is only one, so she asks how they should divide it. Looking at the bottle, Moira says that it seems to have traces of space magic on it. Cheryl asks if she can taste it. She uses her magic to create a bottle for each of you. Moira asks how that is possible. Cheryl says it's not very complicated. It's spatial magic, and as soon as it dissipates, everything returns to its original form. Abel thinks it's something useful. She gives them each a bottle and tells them to be careful, for the teacher said that the medicinal potions were very expensive. Bill sneezes whenever anyone mentions him. He wonders who might have mentioned him. The next day, they began their first lesson. As Abel sits at his desk, he thinks he can teach a normal class. Billy announces the end of class. Students start to leave the classroom. In the hallway, Moira says the class is finally over, and it's lunchtime, and asks Abel what they're going to eat. She says they can think about it on the way to the cafeteria. Cheryl follows them. Since the test, Cheryl begins to have vague feelings for Moira. She approached Moira and asked if she could have lunch with her. Moira apologizes, saying that she had already promised to have lunch with her roommates. She and Abel walk away from her. Cheryl can't take her eyes off them, even when her friend asks her to leave. But she is so happy that Moira smiled at her. Learn and Blur and Mary are greeted by the girls outside the dining hall. Abel apologizes for keeping them waiting. Blur suggests that they hurry up and go to lunch. Moira also rushes everyone, saying she is starving. She likes that there are so many different kinds of food in the cafeteria. Abel says that it is very similar to the cafeteria at her high school. Everyone has taken a plate and is looking for the best place to sit. Lemuria sees the group and calls to them. Abel invites everyone to join her. Abel did not expect to see Pagolite at their table. Lemuria asks Abel to allow her to introduce her roommates. This is Caroline, Alice, and Feline. Abel says she's happy to meet you and says her name. Alice says she knows you. Abel asks if she does. The girl replies that of course she does, and after all she is very famous. Famous for not having magic? The garbage princess. Abel is not happy to hear himself so called, and Moira gets angry and asks the girl what she means. Lernan also pays close attention to the girl. Blur asks Lady Alice if she understands what she's saying and to whom. Abel thinks she hasn't got a word in edgewise, but her words are true. Alice says she didn't mean to offend anybody. She was just saying what everybody else was saying. Caroline apologizes for her friend. Lemuria apologizes to her sister for making her uncomfortable, but the princess says it's okay. Everyone begins to eat. Abel asks Pagolite where his roommates are. The man says that he and Lemuria had something to do and he didn't have time to meet them. Abel knows that they are the main characters and thinks it's obvious that they should always be together. Lemuria invites the princess to taste the cookies she made in her cooking class. Abel is surprised that Lemuria has such a class. She smiles and says that they are allowed to take what they make out of the classroom, and she has made more especially for Abel. And the princess is very grateful. Lemuria says they may not be as good as the ones in the store, but she hopes her sister will like them. Alice thinks that Lemuria's sister is so kind to Abel. She's been asking her for a long time to give her these cookies, but she won't. She also has a handmade magic scroll to give to her sister. She keeps saying that she can do it herself. Eh? Abel has a strange feeling when she receives the scroll. It's no secret that she has no magical powers, so she can accept this and thank her sister. It is the work of the main character and a future great magician. Lemuria takes away her plates and asks Abel if she will go to the library, but the girl does not know if she will. Moira says that she is a bit tired and thinks that she should go back to her room and get some sleep first. Blair says that he and Lemuria are going to warm up for the fencing lessons in the afternoon. Abel comes back to them and asks why they are so early. 
She accidentally bumps into a lady and stains her dress with the remains of her food. She apologizes and asks if the lady is all right. She orders the girl to step aside. She snaps her fingers. Having thus removed the stain from her clothing, she asks what class she is from and what her name is. Lemuria says it's over, and it's her magic teacher, Molly, and she hates people with weak magic the most. Abel thinks she's done. And it seems to be a question why everything in this world depends on magic, and if it is possible to do without it for once. Abel announces his class and name. Molly thinks the name is familiar. She asks if she is the same trashy princess with no magic powers. Abel says the rumor is true. Moira starts defending Abel again, but Abel calms her, saying she is fine. Molly says at least she understands her situation. Abel says that she may have no talent, but she will try to succeed in the martial arts. Molly says she hopes she will. She leaves. Moira asks who she is. She asks Blur why she prevented her from marrying Abel. The girl replies that she is one of the best teachers. If she doesn't like her, her life at the academy will be hell. But Moira doesn't care. Lernan turns worriedly to Abel, but her highness says she is fine. Lemuria apologizes to Abel, saying she didn't know the woman would behave like this. Alice says she has a bad attitude toward anyone who can't keep up with her in class. Abel is incredibly lucky because she hasn't even been punished. The princess asks in surprise if this is true. They put down their plates. Caroline says it is time for them to go. Lemuria says it is time for them to leave and asks them to take care of themselves. She says this scroll will help her in an emergency. It is time for Pagolite to say goodbye. One company bids farewell to another. Moira says that it is very unexpected that in an academy of this level, there are teachers who look down on students based on their abilities. Mary says that there are many people here who feel the same way. Moira says that Mary is very amazing, by the way. The nobles who were trained in martial arts from their youth were not even close to her. She learned everything by herself. She asks Mary to teach her, but the girl says she is not as good as she says, and it was just a way to survive. It is now evening, and the party is again at a fork in the road where they must part ways. Lernan bids farewell to her highness, and Abel also bids him farewell. She gives him a long look. Moira tells her to stop looking because Lernan hasn't gone that far. She asks if she can't take it anymore. Abel is embarrassed and asks what she is talking about. Blur says that although Lernan is her bodyguard, they have heard that he is also a prince of another kingdom. Officially, he was sent here to study, but in reality, he was sent as a hostage to ensure the safety of the kingdom. She says that if Abel had not liked him, he probably would not have been allowed to enter the academy. The princess was in a rather awkward position. Moira says there is definitely a backstory. Abel says this is too embarrassing and asks to stop. But the girls refuse to stop and ask what she liked about it. But the princess again asks them not to bring it up. In the room, Moira tells everyone that she is ready to turn off the lights. The girls agree. They each go to bed. Mary asks Moira if she is ready for bed. The girl says she is. Mary says she has heard them climbing the mountain all day. Moira says they have no idea how crazy this teacher is. Right after they met, he told them to their faces that they were all trash and then made them climb a mountain. She couldn't feel her legs. Abel says that they were still the first to reach the top of the mountain. Blur praises them much, but Moira is already very proud of herself. Mary asks what lessons they will take tomorrow, since they will not be climbing again. Abel expresses that she would not like that at all. And Moira says she can't stand it again, although they feel better after taking the medicine the teacher gave them. But Moira cries and says that he only gave them one day's rest, like a real demon. Blur suggests that they should not think too much about it, as they should get some sleep and talk in the morning. The girls say goodnight to each other. Abel remembers the hurtful words of the teacher, and the same words from Madame Molly. The girl cannot sleep and opens her eyes. She gets out of bed to see if everyone is asleep. She takes a trinket from under her pillow. She leaves the room. But Blur notices this. Abel is very well dressed, but she still feels cold when she goes out. Had she known, she would have worn an extra jacket. What she is looking for must be around here somewhere. She did not expect the school to be so far away. She looks at the jewelry hanging around her neck. For her own safety, Nil has turned this necklace into a magical artifact that will allow her to use her magic freely. He has also hired a tutor to guide her in the study of magic. He will wait until she has completed her studies and returned safely. Abel hopes that this teacher will come tonight or she will freeze to death. Suddenly a voice tells her that she doesn't have to wait any longer and that the teacher is already frozen. Molly, the teacher she had been waiting for, appears before her. The girl says it can't be her and asks if it's really her. The woman asks what it is and if she is disappointed. Abel asks how she can do this and says that, of course it is not. She didn't think that the person who made fun of her this morning would be her teacher. She remembers what Alice told her about the woman. Abel hopes she won't take the opportunity to punish her. In her fantasies, Molly is already standing there like a devil with a whip. The teacher asks what she is thinking about and if all the people around Tamanila are so strange. Abel says she just didn't expect the teacher to be who Neil said he was. Molly is surprised that the girl called Sir Tamanila by her first name. 
Even she cannot call him by such an intimate name, but why should she? Abel sees that the woman looks a little distressed and asks the teacher if she is all right. Molly takes out her wand and asks what the relationship is between her and Sir Nil. Abel raises her hands and says that she will tell everything. She says that Nil is her butler. Molly is even more surprised. Molly likes Nil very much and has even fantasized about him. It is a shock to her that Abel is so close to Nil. Abel asks her not to think of anything strange and says that Nil is just a butler, but she wonders which one of them is strange in the end. Molly calms down and says she knows all about it. Abel thinks that she doesn't really know anything. The woman says that the princess may call her Molly and that Sir Nil has asked her to teach her magic. She will wait for her here every Monday, Thursday, and Sunday night at one o'clock. Molly asks sternly if she and Sir Nil really have no unnecessary relationship. Abel tries to explain that this is not the case. She wonders what sins Nil has committed to bring his admirer to her teacher. Molly begins to teach Abel how to clear his mind and emotions. Magic is everywhere and Abel must feel it. Among all the fires she sees, she must find the brightest flame. The teacher asks what color it is. Abel thinks it is something purple. Molly says it matches. She has to try to control the flame and make it appear on her hand. The locket around the princess's neck begins to glow, and this purple flame appears on her hand. The exercise has worked. Molly says that she has done well and that she's really good. Abel says it's all because of the necklace Neil gave her. He has found a special magic artifact that contains some of the magic she can use. Molly says that of course a gift from Neil can't be bad. Abel notices that her treatment has changed and wonders what kind of relationship she has with him. And she asks how Miss Molly met Neil. The woman is visibly shy, but says it's a long story and that she was just a freshman at the time. Abel tells her to make it very short. The teacher says something about an academic test. Abel asks what she means. The woman replies that she will have one soon. Molly says that this is when Nil came down from heaven. Suddenly, the princess asks how to use spells. Molly says that she must feel her magic and take control of it. She announces that the lesson is over for the day. Abel, expecting it, falls down as if exhausted. Molly says that her level is quite normal for someone who has never learned the basics. The girl falls to the ground and says that it is just wonderful. She notices a book on the floor beside her. She picks it up and asks what it is. Molly says it's the basics of magic and she needs to read it properly. Having said this, the teacher immediately disappears in a glow. Having just said this, they will meet again in three days at the hour of night. The cuckoo clock strikes the hour. Moira covers her face with a pillow and begs Blur to hurry and turn off his magic clock. The girl says she can't, and it's only set to turn off when she gets out of bed. Moira complains to Mary that she is tormenting her. Mary tells the girl that if she doesn't get up, she will be late. Moira immediately points to Abel lying down and sleeping and asks to see that she is not up yet and asks why they are rushing her. The princess wakes up with a black eye from lack of sleep and asks why it is so loud. Blur says that everyone seems to be awake now, but the cuckoo disappears into his nest with a flick of his hand. Moira tells Abel that they went to bed together and asks why the princess is so sleepy. Blair asks if it was unusual for her to sleep in a new city. Moira asks if she is sure. But judging by Abel's behavior, she's just very tired. Moira says it doesn't sound like a bad dream in a new place. In the classroom after class, Moira asks Abel if she's really all right. The princess smiles and says she is. Moira says that she did not look well this morning, as if she had been raised from the grave. Abel remembers how she used to bang her forehead against the glass in her sleep without realizing it. The princess admits that it looked strange. Who knew that Molly would be so strict and that they would practice until four in the morning? Moira says she is tired anyway. She asks to be watched while she sleeps in exchange for letting her sleep during the last hour. Abel secretly reads the book Molly gave him during class. It is impossible to master magic without knowing the basics. Everything comes from the source. To master advanced magic, one must learn the basics. This is where Abel decided to start. Molly returns home and hangs up her robes. She looks at her magic ball and she sees Nil. She talks to Nil and asks if he has decided to contact her after all this time. Nil asks her to be more serious and says he wants to know how her highness is doing. Molly asks him if he knows she likes him and why he still only cares about her highness. She asks if he thinks she might be jealous. He is, after all, a genius among sorcerers, and Molly is the youngest great sorcerer. Nil says the less people know about her training, the better. He asks how her training is going. Molly says that it is going quite well and that she is learning faster than the others. She says that the princess will be very strong in the future. Since Abel and Molly met, every morning starts with a hellish workout by Billy Potter and ends with a workout with Molly. Abel finally gets to rest, and even though it's hard, she likes it. Moira tells the princess that she has been secretive lately. Abel says she is imagining things because she is always with them. At another training session, someone enters Abel's room. The princess immediately hit her flame and asked who was there. Lernan approaches her and tells her that it is him. He asks if she can still use magic. Abel thinks it's the middle of the night and wonders why he's here. And fortunately, Molly has already left. Molly tells him that they are in a special area of time and you can say in the second room. As long as she practices here, she doesn't have to worry about time. 
Abel thinks she is practicing too long. Lerna noticed the pendant of the princess. The boy asks if she practices alone every night. Would she consider it rude if he helped her with her martial arts training? Abel is very happy about this and says she would be very happy if he didn't mind. Lernan says he would be honored, especially since her progress in the martial arts is rather slow. The princess once said that everyone learns martial arts so quickly, but not her. She did not think that the boy would remember the words she had hurriedly thrown out. She said that, in that case, she hoped for him. Lernan is glad to hear this. Abel returns to his night classes. Lernan hurries to join her. The princess is very glad to see her bodyguard, and the boy shows that it is mutual, too. Now Lernan is here in addition to Molly and Bill. Now she has three teachers to help her improve her skills. Bill has already begun to notice that his pupil's skills are improving, and the princess thinks that the result of the training is good. He's taken much of her energy. One day, Abel and his friends were walking around the academy, and Blur asked if the princess was well. The princess smiled and said that all was well. It was as if she had returned to a time when she did a lot of homework. Moira asks what is wrong with her, because she promised to spend time with her, but ended up with a lot of extra training. The princess says it was an accident. The night training continues. Lernan tells her highness that her skills have improved even more. The girl asks if this is true, and the training has indeed paid off. Lernan suggests that they proceed to the next stage, but Abel is already too tired. He says that since she still has magic, she should learn to use it in battle. She sees Lernan's flame glow red. He uses his magic to make a mark on the tree. Abel asks if she can do the same. Lernan says she can try, and as Abel makes her attempt, her necklace begins to activate. The princess awakens her very strong magical power and she makes her mark next to Lernan's magic mark on the tree. The boy says that it is very good for a first attempt and that she has a talent. The princess asks if she really did it, and Lernan praises her. Abel is very happy that she can use magic in this way. She calls to Lernan three times, but he hears her only the last time. When he awakes, he asks what is wrong. Abel asks if he's all right, and he says he is. The boy wants to know what kind of necklace she is wearing. The princess says it is a gift from Nile. She wonders if he understands. Nil says that to be safe, she must tell no one of the necklace's powers. She says that it looks very expensive and that she should hide it under her clothes. Abel thought he was getting too close, so she stepped away from him. And the boy just calmly asked what was wrong. And Abel cannot understand what is wrong with her now. Lernan suggests that they call it a day. The girl sits down on the floor and says that they are finally finished and she's so tired. The boy says that it is not easy to become stronger, but Abel says that he has learned it quickly. Lernan says enough and asks them to get up, for the ground is very cold. He helps the princess to her feet and they lock eyes and just then Lernan sees the seal in her eyes. Class F has a regular class. Abel writes something in his notebook and thinks back to that day, when Lernan noticed her necklace. But considering his intelligence, the princess realizes that he has noticed something. Moira looks in her friend's book and asks whose name she is writing. Moira notices the letters that make up the word Lernan. Abel tells her not to misunderstand and that it is not what she thought. Moira says that when she writes the name, she thinks of him. The princess says it is not true and thinks it will be difficult to explain now. The next day, Abel searched the library for the book she needed. But for some reason, she did not find what she needed. She turned and bumped into someone. Abel looks up to see Lernan. They sit down at a table together, and Abel asks him what he is doing in the library. Lernan says he's here to find books and asks about her. The princess shyly says that she is here for the same reason. Lernan asks if she is looking for books on seals. Abel thinks that it is over, that he understands everything, and that he can't even explain it. Lernan tells her not to worry and that he will help her find them. The boy says that at first he was not sure but now he realizes that his hunch was right. Abel asks why he is helping her since she used to bully him and there is no benefit to him. The boy touches her cheek, but then he abruptly withdrew his hand with the same trepidation, saying that it was because he trusted her. But Abel invented all this. Moira tries to wake her from her reverie. Abel finally pays attention to her friend's many calls. Moira asks why she doesn't answer when called. The girl replies that she is just thinking, but Moira still cannot understand. Her friends just wanted to ask her if she wanted to go to the club fair with them. Abel asks what kind of fair it is, and Mary shows her the flyer. It looks like something dangerous. Blair says it's a flyer for one of the clubs. She says they go to the square after class. There are many clubs recruiting new members. The Alchemy Club. The Magic Medicine Club. Club of Innovative Magic. Club of the Swordsman. They were given a bunch of postcards. The one given to Blair Adele was just one of them. Abel thinks how unhappy they are. Moira suggests they hurry and promises it will be fun. But Abel says she can't go because she has an appointment. Moira asks if it's a secret date but Abel says it's not. She says that they will have to go alone anyway and she will leave this room first and quickly walks out the door. Blur asks if he can go too. Moira thinks that something is definitely wrong. Meanwhile, Abel goes outside, but Moira follows her, thinking that something has definitely happened as expected. The other two friends are with Moira and wonder if she is sure that they're doing the right thing. Lernan appears beside Abel. 
Moira shouts from behind the bushes that she was right. Lernan notices some of the noises. Abel asks him what has happened. The boy says nothing and must have imagined it, and the princess suggests that they go. And the roommates do not know what to do with themselves from shock and shame. Moira says she was frightened to death. Abel searches for something about ancient seals, but no luck so far. She has read many books on seals, but there is nothing about her seal. She looks out of the window and thinks that spring is coming. Lernan approaches her with a pile of books and asks her highness what is the matter, seeing that she is upset. He puts the books on her desk. Abel says there are too many, but the boy smiles and says her seal was placed too long ago, so they can only look to the books for the answer. Abel has a hunch that this seal is the seal of the church. Since she started learning magic, not only can she not feel the seal, but there's also a limitation. The seal blocks the energy so that no one can feel it. This restriction makes the energy useless. She remembers the mage boy from the market and compares him to Pagolite, thinking that although they are very similar, their personalities are very different. But Pagolite says they have met before. The princess thinks that perhaps this will play a part. Suddenly she hears something in the library. She sees Lernan at the end of the room, standing in front of an underground passageway. The boy says he doesn't know that it was here when he arrived. He says it looks like a secret room. He suggests going in, promises to protect the princess from any danger, and Abel goes in without hesitation. Pagolite finds the book left by Abel. Lemuria is with him and asks what it is. The boy says that someone was here, and Lemuria says that they were distracted by something, so they left the book and went away. And for some reason, Pagolite paid attention to the place where the secret passage was opened. As they go down the stairs, the lights come on, and Lernan says that this lamp is powered by magic instead of electricity, so it lights up automatically when it sees people. He says that from the lamp and the markings on the walls, this room must have been built a long time ago. The abilities of the creator must be very high. The boy realizes that it is time to draw his sword and does so. He asks her highness to follow him, and the princess humbly obeys. She asks if his instrument is also a magical instrument for accumulating magic. Lernan says that it is. Magical tools refer to objects altered by magic. Whether it is jewelry or weapons, anything can be changed by magic. They can have different meanings after modification, either a dangerous tool for killing people or a treasure that provides a position in the community. However, the number of wizards who can modify tools is extremely small, making them difficult to obtain even for the wealthy. And among these, the most difficult to obtain is the magical storage tool. The boy reports that they have reached the bottom. Inside, everything is columned and it looks very spacious. Abel thinks that this kind of hidden room is used in the stories to keep some terrible beast or treasure. And such places are usually full of traps and secret passages. Abel throws some coins, and they produce a flame. They leave a pile of ashes. The girl realizes that this is indeed a trap. She doesn't remember seeing this scenario in the novels. Lernan also confirms that it is a trap and that they must be careful. For some reason, Lernan keeps his sword at the ready and tells her highness that during the journey, she walks beside him. The girl thinks it was so polite of him. Lernan looks around very carefully. Suddenly they hear a loud crash. The boy says it's coming. Abel gets scared. A number of arrows begin to whistle at them. But Lernan blocks them with his sword. But at one point he throws it down and begins to run, taking the princess in his arms. The girl is quite surprised at this reaction. The princess warns Lernan that arrows are still flying at them from behind. But the boy successfully deflects them with his sword. Lernan lowers the princess to the ground, and the girl says that it looks like they have already passed this trap. Abel says that looking at the location of the trap, it looks like it won't be so easy inside. She didn't expect Lernan to be so strong and asks if it's black flame magic. She says she has never seen black magic before. The boy is stunned by this question. He says it is dark black magic after all. In this realm, most people are born with magical powers. The most common kinds of powers are natural, such as wind, fire, water, forest, and earth. There are also other variations, such as lightning or ice. One of the rarest is the magical element of light, also known as sacred power. People with holy power are more likely to choose to study to become a priest in the church. However, dark magic is less common than sacred magic. It is the only magic on par with sacred magic. Abel says it's no wonder he's so strong. Lernan does not understand what she's talking about, and the princess tries to say that she didn't mean anything. She thinks that in the future she will have to go against the church. Abel says that they can go because she is sure that Lernan will protect them. They come to a dead end because there is no way to go on. Abel says that the secret room has too many traps. Lernan takes off her jacket and says that there are no more traps and that she can rest now. He puts the cloak on the princess. Sitting on the floor, he tells the girl that the floor is cold and that her highness should be careful not to catch cold. Abel smiles and says that she will try. The girl says that going through all these traps has made her realize that she is weak, but fortunately she survived thanks to Lernan. She says that she's really very weak and gets upset, and Lernan tries to calm her down, saying that she has worked hard and there are just too many traps. 
The girl says that there must be something very important hidden here. And at this point, she remembers that in the original novel, there was a secret book hidden somewhere. The church has always sent people to look for it, but they have not been able to find it. Abel says it must be somewhere in that secret room, but suddenly she loses her balance and begins to fall deeper into the secret room. Lernan can't believe it and tries to catch her, but Lernan falls after her. In flight, the boy catches the princess and she lands in his arms while he falls back to the ground. Abel stands up abruptly, thinking that everything is over and what to do in such an embarrassing situation. Should she say something? She had just touched his chest. She regrets that she didn't have time to feel them properly. His body seems to be in pretty good shape. But Lernan seems to be deliberately approaching the princess. He abruptly turns to the princess and then abruptly withdraws his attention, saying that it seems they are trapped. Abel says that because she was so excited, she must have touched the mechanism, and they fell in. Lernan says that all the walls look the same, and they won't be able to find out where they fell from. Abel suggests that they first try to see if there is a way out, but they never find it. Lernan suggests that they rest for a while and then decide what to do. The princess admits that if she hadn't said she wanted to go to the secret room, they wouldn't have been trapped. She says that if her powers were a little better, Lernan wouldn't have had to protect her. The boy asks her highness why she thinks this. Abel says that if she hadn't touched the mechanism, they wouldn't have fallen here. The princess falls into a strange condition which makes Lernan very concerned about her and tries to bring her to her senses. She says that it is because of her that they will wait here for their death. Her eyes seem to see nothing but these thoughts, but she continues to try to reason with her. Lernan realizes that this is the influence of dark magic. He begins to beat himself very badly about it. He apologizes to her, but kisses her on the lips without asking. Abel faints from the effects of magic and a strong kiss. When she wakes, she sees Lernan again. The girl asks what has happened to her. The boy tells her that demonic magic has entered her mind, and it could have killed her. Abel remembers that she had suicidal thoughts under the influence of this magic. Demonic magic can bewitch people and bring out the worst in them. The princess says it is really frightening. She asks how he got her out of that state. The boy says that demonic magic can absorb itself. Abel notices that he's flushed and wonders why and if it is because absorbing the magic took a lot of energy. Lernan remembers his kiss with the princess and tries to explain it, but then pretends he simply can't remember. Abel begins to worry and asks if she has done anything bad while under the spell. She asks the boy many unanswerable questions. Lernan calms the princess by touching her hand and telling her that her highness thinks too much. He says that the demonic power has already retreated, and the exit door should appear soon. A column with a book on it appears from the ground. Lernan asks if the book is what the secret room was protecting. Abel wonders if this might be the book. It is called a forbidden book. The secret forbidden book is a village book of legends that contains everything about magic on earth. Whoever can use it will rule the world. Lernan takes the book and opens it. Boy is surprised at what he sees. Abel approaches him and asks if anything is wrong. Lernan takes her hand and tells her highness that inside are the methods for removing the seal from her body. But Lernan immediately apologizes to her highness for being rude. The princess says that all is well indeed. The boy wonders what he has done. He hopes that her highness will not think anything of it. Abel asks if anything has happened. Since the boy does not answer, she has to ask again, and he only wanted to stop the bad thoughts. Abel tries to understand why he is in despair. The boy says he is really well. Looking through the book again, he says that when he saw it before, it had everything to do with magic, even ancient magic. Lernan says that they will take the book and study it, and he hopes that by that day they will have removed the seal from her body. Abel thinks that a description of all the secrets of magic in the world will surely be contained in the records of the seal magic. But will the Institute allow her to take the book out of its confines? But she does not want to think too much about it. She thinks she should use the opportunity to find records of seal magic. But first she must find them. Suddenly they hear a loud noise. Abel asks what it was. Suddenly the walls around them begin to crack. They shatter and Abel and Lernan are confronted by a bearded sorcerer accompanied by others. The wizard addresses her highness and asks if she is well. The old magician approaches the princess and asks her again if she is well. Abel greets the chairman apologizes for disturbing him and says that she is well. The magician smiles and says that is good. Bill approaches the princess and asks if she has gained courage and made some progress so that she thinks she can now begin to spread her wings. Molly grabs Laurent's ear and asks him why he dared to do such a thing to her as the princess's bodyguard. The wizard says that the children are well and that is the most important thing, but he asks her highness not to break into a secret room without thinking next time. He says that there are many things in the secret room and asks if her highness has seen anything strange. For example, a strange book that suddenly appeared, Abel tries to answer. But Lernan stops them and says they didn't see it. In all the chaos, Abel didn't even notice that the book was gone. The book was supposed to be top secret, and that's what everyone wants anyway. Abel says she hasn't seen any strange book in this room. The chairman tells them to leave first and not to come back. Lernan and Abel bow before the high wizard and say they will not do it again. He says it is good that they realized they were wrong. 
and asks them not to worry their teacher anymore. He tells Abel to go home and get some rest because she has classes tomorrow. Billy wonders if it is right to let them go. The wizard says they don't know yet and maybe they didn't touch her. Otherwise, if they had come in, they would have seen their dead bodies at once. He orders the secret room to be rebuilt so that it is much stronger and no one else can enter it. Abel finishes his evening exercises again, and Molly tells her not to go anywhere in the future unless she knows what the place is. She asks him to remember. She also tells her to get plenty of rest during the two days off from training, and she immediately disappeared from the princess's sight. But suddenly Lernan approaches her. Abel is very glad to see him. He says he has one thing to say, but before he says it, he creates a magical barrier so that they can't see or hear each other. Abel says it is dangerous and wonders what he is going to tell her. The boy tells her and shows her that he has a secret forbidden book that can break her seal. Abel is very surprised and asks how he can get it out of there. And isn't it in the secret room? How did it get here? The boy tells him that he hid it before the head and the others came. He drew it into his magic cloak and thus snatched it out of Abel's hands. Lernan asks them to look at the book. Lernan asks her highness to look at the book. Legend has it that this is the secret book of all spells, and I wonder if she can break the seal. Even if there is the slightest chance, she will do her best. The book begins to turn its pages by itself, and it seems incredible to Abel. She thinks it's a good thing that all of her mother's old books have been translated. She finds a chapter on the magic of seals, and at that moment the book flies high into the air and Abel Lernan cannot understand what is happening. The boy draws his sword, and the book moves right into Abel. Lernan says that perhaps the book has already recognized her as its owner. Often magic has a soul when it finds its owner, and Her Highness can sense the book's soul now. But Lernan feels no such thing. He surmises that the book is not looking for a master, but a keeper. He says that in addition to finding a master, magic can create a soul. If magic is too strong, it can easily create evil magical energy that seeks a place to store its power so it doesn't lose it altogether. Abel asks if she is just a storage place. One day, the students of Class F had a lesson in the greenhouse. The teacher announces the end of the lesson. She says that the pupils did a good job. Moira asks Her Highness if she has another meeting after school. Abel asks for quiet and says goodbye to his friend. Moira says she will not take time away from her rendezvous. Lernan goes to meet the princess and asks if anything is wrong, but Abel tells her to just go and say nothing. She asks how the book is coming along. She spent all of last night trying to summon the soul of the book, but it was unsuccessful and she failed. Lernan tells her that after their meeting yesterday, he learned that His Highness had apparently been recognized as the Lord at that time. When old books are damaged, it also affects their soul. There are also cases where the soul suffers even if the magic of an ancient book does not cause harm, but the book soon loses its magical power. The boy says that her secret book seems to be in perfect condition, but its magic must be powerful. Abel understands why the book's soul is wounded, and that is why she has chosen it as her keeper. She believes this is so the book can be healed. She says that they should wait until the soul of the book is restored, and perhaps then it will work and they will know what they need to know. Suddenly, Abel does not notice another student coming around the corner and bumping into him. The friends of this student with red hair are worried about him and call him a prince. Lernan asks Her Highness if she is well. The boy begins to shout at Abel, telling her to open her eyes and asking how she dared to hurt the prince. After looking at Abel for a while, the prince asks if this is the strange princess from another kingdom. Abel thinks she has seen him before and tries to remember who he is. Prince sarcastically asks what more he can expect from Lernan's friends, saying it's so pathetic. Suddenly, the princess remembers the man. This is the man she met at the gates of the academy, Vidi's brother, the fourth prince of the Serunia kingdom, Vilno Seplo. This is not mentioned in the kingdom of Serunia itself, but it is known in the neighboring countries with seven princes, including Lernan III. Abel heard that Vilno hates to be called the fourth prince because he feels inferior to Lernan. Vilno and his friends start bullying Ariel. The princess wonders if they are only thinking of having fun. Lernan tells the boys he is speechless. Vilno asks to fight with him. He warns him that there will be punishment for fighting on the territory of the academy. Lernan does not answer. Lernan and Vilno just looked at each other and went their separate ways. On the way, Lemuria tells Lernan that she has heard of Prince Vilno's success in magic. But now, she is sure that Lernan also has many talents, and not only in magic. One day, Princess Abel's company and Prince Vilno's company meet to talk. The prince politely tells the girl that he is glad to meet her, and that she flatters him. Lemuria thanks him for taking care of her sister, and says that she would like to study with him, hoping to improve her magic skills. Vilno addresses Her Highness. At this point, Lemuria takes her sister's hand, a gesture that no one notices. The princess wonders if it is she who is soothing her. Lemuria says she is sure that the prince will not refuse her a little help. Pegolite says that studying is not against the rules of the academy. The boy tells Lemuria that he is only a B student, so how can he compare with her, an A student? The princess says that this is not a problem and that everyone is equal in the academy. Abel asks to be allowed to investigate. She says the boys must have found out. Vilno asks what she means. 
She laughingly asks what she thinks they understood. He asks what her highness can do with her weak hands. Lernan watches all this with courage and patience. But at one point, he advises him to watch his words when he takes up his sword, and Abel asks him to take his time. She says that with Vilno's permission, she will hit him with her little fist. The prince's company laughs with all their might at her affectionately diminutive word. Vilno says that she can certainly hit him with her little fist, pointing at it with her fingers. Lemuria is worried about the princess, but Abel immediately calms her down. She says that she doesn't even know if this guy can take a punch from her. They face each other as if they were equal rivals. Abel eagerly asks her if she can start by clenching her fist. The boy proudly replies that of course she can. Abel swings and hits him very hard in the chest with her hand, so hard that the prince is thrown back a few feet. His brothers come over immediately to see if the boy is all right. He freely asks how she dared to do such a thing. The girl says with a smile that she is sorry, but reminds him that he insisted that she hit him with that small fist, and she did not expect him to take even that. The ruffians leave, saying they will get even with her. Abel thinks he has given up so soon, she credits herself with having learned the technique taught to her by Lernan, thanks to which she was able to fend off the villains. Lemuria begins to sympathize with Abel, but says that her words were too much. Abel takes her sister's hands and tells her she's well. She says that even without magic, she can defend herself with martial arts. She also says privately that it was her teacher who taught her martial arts. Pegalite says that if her highness Abel says so, then there must be no reason to worry. For some reason, they seem strange to Abel. Lernan reminds her highness that it is time for lunch. Abel bids farewell to Lemuria and Pagolite, saying that he and Lernan have more business to attend to today, so they must leave. When Abel meets with Moira, she realizes that she is angry with her. Moira says she called her to look at the union, and Abel ran off on a date. The girl immediately begins to apologize and promises that she will definitely go with her to see the union next time. She wonders who would ever think of going on a date in a secret room of the library. Moira says that if the princess wants to be forgiven, she should do it now. Abel asks why now, since she hasn't even eaten yet. Moira says she can eat, and they should leave immediately. In the academy courtyard, Moira draws Abel's attention to Mary and asks if she is sure it is her. They see the girl handing out leaflets. Abel notices that they are leaflets with information about the union. It is strange that Mary has joined the union. Mary asks everyone to watch out for her as she tries to deliver these postcards, and Abel and Moira ask her to watch for them. The girl asks them what they're doing here. Abel replies that they came to see the new recruits to the Alliance and saw her. Moira asks why Mary joined the Alliance and doesn't bother to tell her. Mary says it wasn't really her idea, at least not at first. Mary doesn't know how to tell the story of how she got here, but Moira tells her not to worry. Moira suspects Mary is doing this to help someone. Mary asks how she knows this, and Moira asks who she thinks she is. Mary is frightened when she sees the head of the Union. Mary immediately begins to chase her friends away, telling them that they should leave, that their social union is not for them, and that they should find another one. Moira is outraged and asks why, saying that he suits her even better than she does. A tall blonde boy appears before them, smiling and telling Mary that it is indeed difficult to find recruits, and asking how she can be unhappy with them. Mary excitedly says that they are her roommates, not recruits. He approaches the girls and kindly asks them to join their Adixuran union. Their union can be found by even the most ordinary locals, but they work hard to improve their skills. Their main goal is to surpass the court aristocracy. Abel asks if they can join a noble commune. Moira adds that they are royalty. Hearing this, the chairman abruptly leaves them. Mary again asks her friends to leave, saying that their alliance does not accept royalty and that she warned them to look elsewhere. Abel politely says that in that case, they will indeed find something else. The Academy has an association for magical experiments, the animal union, and even a sword union. But when Moira learned there was a women's union, she immediately decided to go. And Abel, as soon as she saw the union, realized at once that it was as if it had been made for her. Moira said the same thing and asked the princess to look for something else, but she joined it herself. So Abel decided to come to the reception of the community of special magic. The princess greets a boy sitting at the table. He has a very distracted look, and this is the head of the Avali Babetsky community. The boy asks if she wants something, and the princess replies that she wants to know what kind of special magic it is. Aluvali says that special magic is any magic that goes beyond the ordinary. He asks if she is interested and hands her a card. Barriers, seals, monster domestication, treaties, all are part of the special magic their community is researching. Looking at this flyer, the princess thinks it is a bit scary, and who would ever think of joining? She thinks that at least the special magic includes the magic of the beginning, so maybe she can find something useful for herself. Alivali asks not to be misunderstood, and explains that they are not a club of thieves, and that it is not surprising if she is not interested in their community, because she is not the most popular. Abel thinks that she will look, but not join. Abel asks what he has to do to get in. 
The words make him a little embarrassed, and he thinks about it. The guy suddenly stands up and asks if she really wants to do this. Abel is a little scared and asks if it's not possible. The boy says that of course he can, but his mouth begins to bleed. Abel is even more frightened and asks what is wrong with him. Aluvali asks her not to worry and says that this happens every time he experiences strong emotions and there is no reason to worry. Aluvali calmly wipes away the blood, sits down in a chair, takes a pen, and asks Abel what her name is, saying that he will fill out a form to join their community. The princess tells him her name is Ophelia. He tells her to come to the place mentioned in the note tomorrow at 12.30 and gives her the note. The princess feels that she's digging her own grave. The next day, the princess arrives at the abandoned building where the meeting was scheduled. A large rat jumps out of the broken window of this house, and the princess is very frightened. She thinks that she couldn't have come to the wrong place, and that there could be nothing worse than a Class D office. It is indeed a bit spooky there. Suddenly, Aluvali comes out of the house and says he is glad to see her. He says that he has been waiting for her for so long that he thought she would not come, although Abel had come ten minutes earlier. Aluvali pushes the girl to the back and asks her to come in. They are already waiting for her. They blow up a firecracker. The fourth member of the Ophelia community is welcomed. Abel can't believe that there can be only four people in the club, but with a smile, he says it's true. Abel thinks there is no turning back. As expected, she is caught. Aluvali embraces Abel and tells everyone that although they are few, they are the only ones. One of the girls from the club asks not to blame the chairman for being too enthusiastic and says that there is a possibility that their club will be closed if they don't recruit new people this year. Abel asks how that is possible. A man asks Abel to sit down. He says that all clubs at the academy are required to take in new members every year. If no one joins the union for three years in a row, the student council will consider the union useless and close it down. A girl says that the student council consists of the 12 best students under the supervision of teachers. They are given special rights over other students. They say that the head of the student council is not very interested in solving the students' problems, so his deputy is in charge. Aluvali says that Abel is with them now, so they are not in danger of being shut down. A girl member of the club asks Aluvali not to forget that the guild meeting is in three months. Abel asks what kind of meeting. The boy says that each of the unions will present their achievements to the teachers. And based on the presentation, the councils of teachers and students distribute funds. The girl tells us that this is the second year they have had the smallest budget, which makes it even harder for them to attract new people. All these other people just don't understand what they're doing. Abel says she doesn't really understand either. She's told that her fellowship is mainly concerned with the development and use of special magic, and that she will soon understand as well. Aluvali asks for a brief introduction. He says that he is the head of the special magic research community, Aluvali Bobetsky. The girl says her name is Ispe Setyan, but you can just call her Iz. The boy says that his name is Kino Makwari. The princess says her name and that she is very happy to meet you. The Society for the Study of Special Magic lives up to its name. They have magic books you can't even find in a library. Abel is told that all the old books were brought by Aluvali because they once belonged to his family. But Aluvali has the rarest magical ability in the world, and that is time. He can control another person's time, slowing it down or speeding it up. But the price of such a powerful power is the wielder's health. He may not be able to see it, but he cannot escape his fate. This is the main reason he founded a community for the study of special magic. Although there are a huge number of magic books, none of them contain the slightest mention of the seal. Abel wonders if she should turn to a recently found book, but she still can't feel its soul. The princess hopes to be cured soon and is anxious to get to the bottom of the seal. At the next class, Billy's teacher asks for attention, saying he has a very important announcement. He asks that his congratulations be accepted. He says that the trial final examination is now open. Billy says that this time they can divide into groups of four. He says they have two weeks before the test and they should make the most of it. Abel mentally begs him not to smile like that. Moira tells the princess that they can form any group they want and they can all be in the same group, and she is so happy about it. But for some reason, Abel apologizes. Moira says that she understands and that she wants to be in a group with Lernan. Abel coughs and says yes. She gets up from the table and says that she has things to do, so she has to go. Moira says that she understands now and that she can run after her Lernan before someone steals him. Abel asks what he means by stolen. On the street, Abel meets Lernan by chance. The boy says he was looking for her to tell her something. Abel also says it was a coincidence and that she was also looking for him to tell him something. But she thinks they want to say the same thing. They both want to be in the same group for the trial. They have created the groups and it's time to create a name. Lernan asks if she has any suggestions, but Abel says she doesn't have any yet. She thinks about the name, but is distracted by the delicious pasta she and Lernan are eating in the dining room. She asks if they should call their group Carbonara, like the pasta. Lernan says this sounds good and suggests we stop there. Abel says what a delicious noodle it is. 
Suddenly, Pagolite interrupts their conversation and asks if they can join their group. Abel has a bad feeling, but she still smiles. Along with Pagolite, Lemuria also turns to them. When they said they could choose their own teams, she immediately thought of Abel. She met Lernan on her way here and they came together. Abel thinks there will always be danger in a team with a girl in charge. Abel asks God to help him understand how to say no to someone without being rude. Lemuria asks if she feels uncomfortable around her. Abel says that she is certainly not and wonders who dared to disturb the main character. Abel tries to explain that she had just talked about it with Lernan and that the four of them had never studied together, so she was afraid it wouldn't work out. Pegalite says they are in the top three at the academy, and he doesn't think there will be any trouble. So their team could be in the top three, Lernan, Pagolite, and Lemuria. Lemuria asks Abel if he remembers what his father said before they left. Abel remembers that he told them to be careful and to take care of themselves. She says they should also take care of each other. She says that is why Abel must be there for her. Abel ends up letting the leader's girlfriend join the team. She thinks she should just wait and see what happens but she hopes there will be no unforeseen situations. At night, she practices martial arts with Lernan again. But the boy noticed that her highness was worried about something today, and he asked what it was. Abel apologizes for asking if it is so conspicuous. Lernan asks if she is worried about the test. The girl replies that she is a little. The boy asks her to be sure that he will protect her. Lernan tells her that they still have time and that she should rest and that they will start training again tomorrow. They say goodnight. Billy finishes another lecture. Students leave the classroom. Moira says her team is already formed and asks Abel how they are doing since she can't be one of Lernan. Abel says they have Lemuria and Pagolite with them. Moira says that the top three are on her team, and she has the win in the bag, that's for sure. She asks Abel to share at least one person with her, as she also wants to be surrounded by the best. Abel says all she has to do is convince her to join her team. She thinks her main character might leave, but she wouldn't mind. But Moira realizes that she has no chance. Abel says goodbye, saying she has to train. Moira gets angry. She meets Lernan in the corridor. She greets him with joy. The girl asks him why he is so early and if they have not arrived yet. Lernan says he had nothing to do until they arrived and asks if she would like to practice with him for a while. But Abel is sure they'll be here any minute now that they've opened the simulator. When Lernan went to open the simulator, Pegalite approached the princess. He asks if they are the only ones who have come. And Abel says that Lernan is here, but he has left. She wonders if he has already graduated. She thinks that the simulation of such an academy will not be like a simple computer game. She remembers the time when they used to get together with their friends to fight monsters. Abel tells Pagolite that since he is already here, they can go in, but the boy asks her to wait a bit. He holds out his hand with a woman's bracelet on it. Abel thinks this bracelet looks familiar. It is very similar to the one the astrologer gave her. The man says it's a gift for her, Her Highness, but Abel says she cannot accept such a precious thing. Pagolite tells her not to worry. The bracelet is blessed and will protect her during her training. He asks her to help him put the jewelry on her hand, but Lernan comes up behind her and hugs her pushing Abel away from the Pagolite. He says this is not necessary. Lernan says that he will protect her highness and that the young master has nothing to worry about. Pegolite picks up the jewelry from the floor and says that there must have been a misunderstanding, that he just wanted to be sure. He says that he never intended to doubt the abilities of the princess's bodyguard. Lernan hugs the princess and she suggests that it's better not to. Lernan apologizes. At this point, Lemuria appears and asks what's going on. Pegolite and Lernan look at each other with a steady, wary eye. Lemuria asks everyone what happened. The princess says she doesn't know. The girls are frightened by the two rivals. Suddenly smiling, she says that it would be sad if the bracelet broke, and it's good that it's intact. These words are very reassuring to the princesses. This bracelet temporarily hides mana, magic scrolls, and more. It was designed to keep her highness safe, but it was the wish of the church and his highness. Abel thinks that if she refuses, it might be thought that she doesn't trust the church and that could lead to a conflict between her father and the church. She says that if it is her father's decision, she will accept the bracelet. She thinks that even though she does not like the idea, it is better than going against the church. Lernan tries to talk her out of it, but Abel won't listen. The boy bows and says he understands. The princess hesitantly stretches out her hand, but Pagolite gives her the bracelet anyway. The princess asks if it would be better to entrust the jewelry to Lemuria, since she feels that she would not be able to keep it herself. She wants to take it off, but can't. Lernan asks what's wrong. Pegolite says that the church put a special spell on the bracelet to prevent it from being lost. After it is put on her highness, only she can use its power. He asks Lemuria if she has a similar item. The girl asks if he means the pendant that is now around her neck. She didn't even know it was her father's. Isn't this the mysterious necklace that belonged to the fortune teller in the secret room? Abel thinks that if Lemuria has the same one, then everything is okay. Her necklace looks a little different, so she thinks that Pegolite is definitely connected to the fortune teller. Lernan asks to be sure that he will find a way to remove this bracelet. Lemuria says she trusts him completely. Lemuria suggests that Abel go inside as soon as possible. 
The team enters the first simulation where they have to kill a monster that looks like a bear. The battle begins. When the workout finally ends, Abel falls to the ground, exhausted. After discussing their training, the three leaders decide that it was too bad. They suggest that Abel try again, and the girl listens in silent horror. She asks if it will happen again, and it is clear that she does not want to do it at all. She begs for mercy. After the training, Abel was completely powerless. Lemuria asks the girl how she feels. The princess says she is fine and never better. Lemuria says that when they return, they will have to analyze today's training and everything that went wrong to improve tomorrow. After the training, the friends say goodbye. When Lernan and Abel are alone, the boy says he didn't notice anything suspicious. He says that if it is the same person, he is definitely a master of disguise and will not give himself away so easily. At first, Abel suspects Pagolite, but he has left no traces that would point to him. But this bracelet looks exactly like the one from the Divine House. And she cannot believe that it is a mere coincidence, and it does not come off. Pagolite asks to keep the bracelet until the end of the trial, as if she had a choice. He pats her on the head and tells her not to worry about things she can't fix. He says it is better to focus on the test now. Abel smiles and says that he is right and that she needs to deal with this first. She thinks she will ask Pagolite to remove the bracelet once the test is over. On the way, Lernan tells her highness that she can use magic during the battle and then everything will be much easier. But Abel says that this is her deadly trick and she only uses it on special occasions. She asks to keep it a secret. Half a month later, many students have gathered near one of the towers of the academy. Abel is surprised to see so many people here and Lernan asks her to be careful. Lemuria and Pagolite notice them and call them over. Suddenly, the wizard of the academy addresses them from the tower and greets all the students. If you don't want to miss my new videos, support the channel by subscribing and don't forget to like the video.